All right, we are live. Hey, May. Hi, everyone. Glad to have you all here. So we're going to be finishing up the wing today, I believe. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Awesome, yeah. awesome. Yeah. yeah, so welcome everyone who's here. We are Evolve Artists, helping artists around the world get pro art skills. In about one year's time, May has learned from Kevin Murphy, and she's an up-and-coming artist, and uh, Kevin's been doing some uh, summer intensives. Kevin, by the way, is the founder of Evolve, and May is uh, his apprentice. So thank you very much, May, for being here. One quick announcement is Kevin and I, I'm Daniel Folta, I'll be in the chat as well, we are having a live webinar on August 2nd. So for those of you who are interested in the Evolve program, so if you're a prospective student, want to check it out, I highly recommend that you um, come join us then. Kevin and I will be there. May will actually be helping out with a live stream on this end, and we'll have instructors and students. It's going to be a great place to see like, how Evolve works and how we actually are doing this revolutionary stuff, like getting people to pro art skills in one year. It's crazy. But we're doing it, and we're happy to show you how it works. Anyways, there's my little plug. <laughs> now we're going to spend the rest of the time enjoying our time with May. Thank you. Okay, um, yeah, Daniel pretty much said it. I'm gonna be trying to finish the wings today, or at least finish covering them. So basically just doing all the lights. Um, yeah, that's about it. Um, my palette's like a little all over the place. I have little pockets of colors. So here's all like the really warm stuff that's like in the part where the wing overlaps with the back a little bit, um, where I did some special effects in Photoshop. Um, and then this is the color that's supposed to match the flat that's already down on the canvas now, uh, the panel. So to help stuff blend into each other a little bit better, it's also a nice, like, warm kind of neutral tone. Um, this is, like, I don't think this is actually in the painting, but I think it'll be helpful to have as something to mix into the other colors to kind of make them a lot warmer or darker. So it's kind of like a toning color. Um, this is, like, a little string of lights. Um, and this is more of, like, a neutral shadow as well in line with this, so... We have like this little triangle going on, this little puddle, this pair. It's fine, we'll figure it out. <laughs> so yeah, I think it'll be, I always say this, but I try to start with the darkest value and then work my way up and then it kind of just becomes uh, doing whatever I have to. <laughs> so I'm just gonna start off there and then do whatever you have to. That's a nice drink you've got there in the corner. Is that also <laughs> part of the, the palette? Yes. Definitely. Yes? <laughs> oh. This is a courtesy of the founder, Kevin Murphy. Um, Some nice coffee to <laughs> perk us up for our evening live streams. I'm just streams. gonna move this right here. <laughs> Perfect, yeah. People always ask, like, what's different between like the Art Academy and Evolve? The difference is you get nice coffee sometimes. <laughs> That's all. So it's looking a little light, so I'm just gonna take some of this to tone it. See, I, I already, I'm already having the improv, it's okay. Um. Already making changes. Perfect, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there we go, that's good. So last time I did most of the shadows in the wings, but like in general, this whole area that I didn't touch is like a bit lighter, so I was okay with leaving it. But for now, I'm just gonna be putting in some of the shadows sorry, um, that are between the feathers. This will help me figure out where to put the lights as well. Awesome. And if anybody has any questions for May, you are more than welcome to ask. That's what I'm here for, to help you have a conversation. We're just gonna straight up take some of this and then just that's, okay. <laughs> Take some of this and then darken it a little so I don't have to keep remixing it every like three brush strokes. It'll get a little irritating. should work pretty well.
All right, first question of the evening from Cryptic Ooh. Art. Hello. Hello, but do you use water oil paint, water-based oil paint? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> it's just old no. Holland. I think it's just yeah. oil, just regular oil paint. Yeah. <laughs> It's looking a little warm, so I'm gonna mix in a cooler color with my brush because that's how I do things. <laughs> we can't see what you're doing there, okay. so do be mindful of how you're leaning over. Mm -hmm. um, which one were you referring to? Basically, I just took the darker puddle that I mixed okay. like two seconds ago, and then I just added a little bit of blue. Okay, awesome, thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm thinking that I can kick us off with some questions for the evening. How does that sound? Sounds lovely. You ready? Yes. Okay. This question, everyone is welcome to answer. So I'll also drop it into the chat. We'd love to hear everybody's opinions on the matter. There's no real right or wrong answer. It sounds political. <laughs> <laughs> no, not quite. Okay. Do you feel that technical training in art has limited your creativity? Oh, not at all. I think it's actually done the opposite um, because it allows you, or just, yeah, me, you, anyone in general, to like be able to actually express and manifest the ideas you have for different works and paintings and whatever art you want to create in a much more effective and realistic way. Um, and then realism, therefore, translates into like being convincing to whoever's looking at it. So I think yeah, technical training, training definitely, um, at least in my case, has helped uh, boost my creative output and potential. Um, yeah, I don't think it's limited me in any way, quite the opposite. Awesome. We'll see what other people's thoughts are. I know for me, when I was 15 years old <laughs> and my mom was trying to drag me into Kevin's class, mm -hmm. uh, that was the first thought that I had had was, mm -hmm. and I wasn't even making anything special, but <laughs> I thought that I was special, I guess. <laughs> and um, I remember just thinking like, oh no, the unique original thoughts that I have now you know, thinking that they were so original and unique, even <laughs> though they weren't, um, they could potentially be like led in the wrong direction or something like that. And I think the fear was that like, if someone told me that this was like a good thing to do it like this, then then I would think that way. And so then I would become limited. Mm. And, uh, but as I discovered, I got the skills and realized, wow, I've been more creative than ever <laughs> with all the possibilities of being able to, to do things. And I mean, even just like, there's also different kinds of creativity as well. You know, mm -hmm. as artists, we, we tend to think of creativity as just like having good ideas, but there's also like, you know, how do you solve a problem? Like if yeah. you're trying to get to a certain goal and can you find a solution to that problem? And there's a lot of creativity in that as well. Um, so yeah, so now my answer would be that a technical training in art is like learning a language, learning the alphabet, the grammar, and now I can speak in a language that not only makes sense to me, but makes sense to other people. And so I can let my creative ideas be heard and recognized, which is pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. All right, let's hear what the answers in the chat are. Okay, Cryptic Art said nope. Um, and Dark Star said no way. It's definitely helped me take my art to where I want to be. Eddie also said no way. Technical skills allow the artist to accurately portray her vision as soon as possible. Only once she becomes an expert does she have the right to ignore them in service to her art. Sarah Price said it has opened up my creativity. I never thought that I'd have skills like these and I'm barely halfway through. Halfway through the Evolve program, I think Sarah might be referring to there. 
Debbie said, no, I can paint with more options and control now. Alex, I remember Kevin once said something to the tune of, you have to learn the rules like a pro to break them like an artist. Yes, that was actually Picasso. But Kevin may have quoted Picasso. <laughs> uh, Kevin is not Picasso, just to... Kevin is very much not Picasso. Yeah. <laughs> but a uh, great, great quote from Picasso. If anything, this is Alex continuing, if anything, maybe technical skills are a process of discovering creativity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that's a good way to put it. Um, Darkstar said, plus many of the greats were technically trained before venturing into their own stuff. This is true, and that's actually true of Picasso. Um, Sarah confirmed, yes, in, Evol in Evolve in Block 4. Awesome. Well, that's a pretty overwhelming uh, response there. That's pretty mm -hmm. cool. We have consensus. <laughs> Maybe I was the odd man out as a 15-year-old kid. I think every kid as at 15 was the odd person out. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Michael Scott has joined us. That's wonderful. Um, Michael Scott is asking, does the size of the brush matter or is it how you use it that counts? Um, definitely more so the latter. Um, it's how you use it that counts. Like I could use a really tiny brush for this and be like hyper precise with my marks, but it would take a really long time for like no reason. Um, when I could get the same effect by like kind of layering and being specific with a bigger brush at the same time. So I don't think the type of, I mean, for me, like I use the same type of brush for like everything. It's just like different size. Um, but generally it's just time. Like the only difference for me is like how long every brush takes to cover the canvas or the panel or whatever um, in like a way that is specific enough to kind of meet my needs. So. Yeah, definitely like brand of brush or whatever, that sort of thing doesn't really matter, I think. Or well, at least it shouldn't be a priority when you're like learning. Yeah. Yeah, in Evolve, we simply have our students just use the largest brush that fits in that space that they're painting. Mm -hmm. Keep it pretty simple to start. Um, there were some other questions that I'm gonna catch up with here. Let me see. Um, May, do you have any experience painting live models? Um, only a few times. That was, I guess, like four years ago I did that. Um, I think Kevin used to do like live models during the foundation program. Um, as kind of like, because we would do like proportional drawing, like from direct observation, like from the table. And so having live models was like an extension of that, just like with people instead of like cones or napples um, to like measure in real time. Um, but not like seriously or anything. Um, and then since then, I've, I've experienced like drawing, not really painting, or uh, like live models. Um, I used to go out to, um, like during second semester, so like a few months ago, and for a few months, I went out to uh, Dorian Vallejo's studio, actually out in Pennsylvania a few times, like every week. Um, and he would have like live models sit and I would go out with Kevin and we would draw together for a few hours at a time. That was really cool. That is cool. It's a yeah. cool opportunity. <laughs> it was very surreal getting out of the car every time. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was like thinking about it. I was like, I don't really have it. And I was like, oh my God, I do. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, it's been a while. I think he closed that studio though, cause like not enough people were going out to really support it, I think, which really sucks.
So I went back to that original darkest value I had before, before mixing another one. Um, so I guess it's my second darkest value now. I'm kind of just putting it where I think it needs to go. I'm covering a lot of what I put down before with the darker value that I made um, because I think like a lot of areas have like kind of gradients between those two values, so an overlap is fine. Um, and then there are some places where there are some like weird reflections and overlaps of the wings where kind of like in the lines that I've made or the marks that I've made, um, there are like patches of this lighter value. So just putting them, putting it where it belongs. It's quite peaceful tonight. <laughs> nice now. and peaceful. Nothing wrong with that. Questions are always welcome. Not, obli not obligated, excuse me. Here's a question for you. Mm -hmm. Are you going to glaze this once it is painted in? Yes. That'll probably be part of next week's live stream. Probably won't be like totally necessary, but you know, um, it'll definitely help enhance the image overall. Question from Eddie. Mm -hmm. When painting from dark to light, do you sometimes find that it is difficult to get the lights light enough without increasing the contrast too much? Um, not really. I think in general, I just have, I have like more experience mixing colors. So I don't really run into like um, the issue of like running out of value as often now. Um, and I'm like very conscious of like what white looks like relative to all the colors that I mix. Um, like I pay attention to that like a lot like in my head and also just in real time when I'm mixing colors and I always try to keep my lightest value like pretty far away from it. Um, so I always have room. But I, yeah, it's definitely something I have experience with but it's just like through more experience I've kind of been able to work through it.
It's interesting to me how the color that you're putting down right now mm -hmm. on the palette looks like a shade of grayish purple, mm -hmm. but then when it's being put there on the painting with that subtle red mm -hmm. undertone, and then compared to the other more pink colors, it appears to be more of a shade of blue. Mm. So you just uh, yeah. added some more purple to it, so now it's falling in line with the other <laughs> colors. Yeah, colors are relative. It's always cool to see. Working within those very subtle, within a subtle range, you can still bring out a lot of colors if you're being thoughtful about it. So it's cool to see in your, in your wings already. Thank you. Doing my best to like not lose track of which feather I'm working on with the reference. Kind of hard though. <laughs> uh. Becky said she likes the shape of the feathers at the top. Thank you. See with how the color I'm putting down now like matches pretty well with the stuff I put down last time. Um, yeah, it really does. So, that was good. I was like doing this by myself, I'd have like one finger kind of like moving across every feather that I work on. You now like when you first start learning to read, like your teachers will sometimes tell you to follow along like by putting your finger like underneath whatever word you're reading, help you keep track. That's what I'd be doing right now. <laughs> huh. I've never done that in painting before. Really? Yeah. I, I had to do that a few times. It was like mostly, I think it was only with wings really. Um, sure. It's like all the shapes are like so similar. But mm -hmm. all like slightly different enough where you can't just kind of blindly do it. Um. Nicholas Probst just jumped in, or should I say, he said, hey, I'll just flew in to watch <laughs> some feathers being painted, looking awesome. Nice, thank you. Here's a question for you, May. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on painting with black? Um, usually I don't use black that much when I'm mixing colors because it tends to drain color out um, and I like things, and usually that's, Usually things have more color than you think they do, um, at least in my experience. Um, so I don't use it super often. Um, just like white, it's, you know, they're kind of on the really extreme ends of the visual spectrum, so you don't see them that often, so I don't find them super applicable. Um, even on like all the dark colors you see here are like combinations of like dark red or like dark turquoise, dark purple, dark blue, and I like kind of mix them all together so the chroma is all like neutralized and then which is like this really dark, but like really um, colorful sort of sort of shadow. But in general, like black by itself tends to fall very flat and isn't really applicable, so I don't use it very often. I'm not sure if that's how I was supposed to interpret the question, but um, <laughs> yeah, yeah.
I'm just aggressively looking back and forth between my reference and the painting. Uh, where am I? All right, I've got another question for you, May. Okay, shoot. <laughs> what is your process for channeling inspiration? <laughs> Do you create it or does it just come to you? Um, I guess there's, there's a, did you say like inspiration or creativity? I feel like there's a difference. Um, my question was inspiration. Okay, yeah. Um, I feel like at this point I'm, I've been like creating stuff like at a constant rate, like consistently for like such a long time that I almost like am subconsciously always looking for new ideas. Um, and so since that part of my brain is like always activated, um, it's always like looking for things, whether it be like, you know, I'll, I'll be like driving and then kind of like look down at my arm and there's like a gradient between like, not, a, not even a gradient, but like, like the sun is like hitting my arm really strongly and then there's like right along the, the cast shadow of my head or something, there's like this super nice band of like chroma or something. Um, or like I'll be like just like scrolling on the internet and then looking at other people's art and kind of like screenshotting whatever compositions or color combinations I like and that sort of thing. Um, and then my brain is always like trying to work like all these things I see that I like, like and enjoy and um, kind of put them together into something like an image that would work, um, that would like be able to be like created through Photoshop or in a photo shoot and that sort of thing. Um, so it kind of, it's become like a habit for me, I would say, um, to kind of find inspiration um, in different images or just like bits of real life. Um, but it definitely wasn't like that before all the time at least, um, but I think at least for me, it's something, as long as you make a conscious effort to like look for it um, and you're like patient with it and you don't try to convince yourself that like everything you see is really cool or you're like really critical of, every, of everything you see and being like, oh, that's not cool enough to like demand like art of me or something. As long as you kind of just, you have to just kind of passively want it, I guess, if that makes sense. Um, and usually I find that you'll find something um, It's kind of my experience. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, so it's almost like a, a, some sort of cultivated mentality for you at this point. Yeah. As you're going through life, you're, you're always sort of ready to catalog an idea mm -hmm. and cash it away. Yeah. So do you have like a library, like an archive of things just waiting to be done at this point? Um. Or is the rate of your productivity match the rate of inspiration or something like that. Does that make uh, sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, in general, like, I have a bunch of, I have this, like, really long note in my computer of just, like, ideas I want to draw. And it's just, like, this bullet point, like, list that goes on for, like, more than a page. And it's kind of embarrassing, but it's okay. Um, uh, and then, you know, I, I keep, like, Pinterest boards in my camera roll, um, constantly full of, like, stuff I like. Um, but, like, I think there's a difference between the stuff you like and enjoy and, like, want to implement into your work versus, like, the stuff that you kind of really enjoy enough. Wait. I feel like as I'm creating things or, like, planning out compositions, I kind of pull from everything I'm, ex I'm like, perceiving or experiencing kind of, like, all at once. Like, not directly, but, um kind of like a small part of a composition that I saw or like um, like a few color combinations that I saw somewhere else or like like an interesting like shape or object or structure or something like that. So I'm kind of just like pulling from very miscellaneous places like all at once. Um, 
based on like what's currently like in my content rotation, like in recent memory or experience. So I guess like I like what I create now is like not explicitly based in like what I'm inspired by and see. And like the list of ideas I have are kind of like all explicit like concepts um, that I want to create and like I haven't caught up to that yet. But in general, I think I'm like caught up in what I like and what I appreciate and what I see um, at the current moments in my work. Does that make sense? Kind of. Yeah. <laughs> I guess like the list of ideas is just like explicit like scenes or characters or like, yeah, ex explicit like scenes or characters um, that don't have like specific compositions or colors or anything in mind. But like the opposite is true for what I'm like actually doing um, where I do have like explicit um, compositions and colors in mind, but they're like pulled from like all these different sources that I'm like interacting with and seeing. I think that was, I think that was better than <laughs> the first time I tried to explain it. Um. Yeah, so kind of just picking and pulling from different sources to mm -hmm. create something that's original in yeah. a way. Yeah. Thrifted originality. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool. I think one thing that's just very noteworthy about you explaining all that is the fact that you do um, take the, like you're saying, like take screenshots, putting things on, you say Pinterest? Yeah. <laughs> um, notes or whatever. Like you're actually making the intention to save these ideas. Um, and I think that's pretty powerful. Not only does the very act of saving ideas help you remember them, and keep them like in the front of your mind but also um it's just be, yeah like it doesn't it lets it lets you sort of always be able to access those different things and it's again it's that intentionality and and then it allows you to that like intentional lifestyle mentality thing that we talked about it's like mm -hmm. yeah that just makes you very powerful um and i'm thinking about that because glenn you had shared it comes to me but it leaves before i can do anything with it i'm so mm -hmm. busy and I feel like that's a lot of people. Um, and so I would encourage you to, like, if it's, if it's a great idea and if it kind of ignites a spark and for, sort of brings you to life, it's probably worth taking a few extra seconds just to file it away mm -hmm. um, for the future. Um, and if you can, you know, in that moment is when it's like speaking the most to you and that's probably the best time to like express um, what it means to you in that moment as you're taking that note so that when you revisit it again, that's, that spark will be there to remind you again. I don't know if you already do that, but hopefully that helps. Let's see some other answers here. Dark Ghost said, mine just comes to me a light bulb moment in my brain. Those are nice. <laughs> yeah. Nicholas Probe said, my inspiration varies like something challenging is sometimes can be fun to try sometimes it's just cool effects with depth and color and other times it's an emotional subject yeah let's see Debbie said, sometimes work for years, getting original idea down into form. Other times things flow quickly without a real plan. Eddie said, sometimes an image comes to me as I daydream, but I still have to work it out mm -hmm. because it's often vague. Yeah, Other I times I sit down and think of images. Yeah, I can relate to that a lot, Eddie, myself. Actually, I remember Kevin telling me that most of our initial ideas are, are like infant ideas. Mm -hmm. And um, when it comes to making compositions, um, he very gently told me, like, don't get married to uh, that original idea, yeah. like the way that you first saw it, mm -hmm. but instead challenge yourself to think of different ways that you could explain the same idea from different angles, um, different perspectives, stuff like that, mm -hmm. and do a bunch of them and, and try not to be locked into one thing. And you'll, f you'll probably find that you'll come up with something that's a little bit more creative, a little bit more unique, 
a little more thought provoking mm -hmm. by forcing yourself to continuing to work on that on that little idea and turning it into something more powerful. Okay, some questions for you. Alex has a good question, but mm. I'm going to save that one. I'm going to file it away. <laughs> good inspiration. Thank you. Uh, I'll address that in a second. But um, DD is asking, hi, May, do you have a yeah. favorite temperature to work in? I've never worked in an art room with air conditioning. Maybe they don't want the fumes to spread through the building? Um, I'm like a normal person, like 72 degrees room temperature. <laughs> I don't know. I don't like to be freezing. I don't like to be sweating either. I don't think it makes that big of a difference. I mean, if the temperature is like uncomfortable enough to the point where it's a distraction, then, you know, I don't like it. But um, I wouldn't say I have like a favorite temperature. <laughs> now, does the paint spread differently depending on the temperature? I wouldn't know. Sorry. Um, I've worked in some freezing conditions. <laughs> I've done some outdoor plein air painting in snowstorms. Wow. <laughs> and uh, the consistency was definitely different because the paint was freezing on me while I was painting. So, yeah. But I think for the most part, it's not going to have a huge effect. I think it's more humidity that could have a mm. significant effect. Maybe not as much on how it spreads, but more in how it's how fast it's drying and interacting with the other paint. Yeah. Um, so it is good to have, um, like you don't want a room that, that has no air circulation. Yeah. In general, like for yeah. your health. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, the paint will be fine. Got to keep everybody alive here. Yeah, being, being alive while painting is going to help you paint. Oh. Yeah, yeah. That's all I have to say. Uh. <laughs> great, great point. Wow. You know, not said enough. <laughs> <laughs> She's so insightful. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I've worked, like, at home a few times, and my parents don't like to keep the AC on, like, super strongly, and so I was doing some stuff over the summer, and... Paint was literally just drying within like an hour of like putting it out and that was like very difficult to work with. Um, but yeah, I don't know about it like spreading or anything. It's more about drying time, at least in my experience. And a question for you from Tony. Yes. Do you ever find it challenging to keep up with where you're working uh, where you're at working on the wings, it looks like it could be tedious at times. Um, I guess, like, it's kind of hard to keep track of, like, which exact feather I'm working on. Um, so, and usually to solve this problem, I try to use, like, one color at a time, and so that keeps you moving across the entire area. But sometimes, like, I can't do that because um, I can't find the exact color in the same place, so I have to switch to a different color, and then that kind of sets off this chain reaction of me just kind of switching to different colors wherever I see them in parts of the painting. Um, and usually I kind of end up painting whatever like jumps out to me the most from the image. And so I kind of put in as many like landmarks as possible um, and then kind of fill in the spaces between them, which actually tends to like work out because the landmarks help me, you know, determine like where, like which feather something is on or which exact like place something is. Um, and then I can like work around it more accurately. So, yes and no. I get lost, but sometimes it helps. <laughs> yeah, and having that process certainly helps. Mm -hmm. um, like, you're not just painting what you feel like painting. Yeah. You're working your way through um, from color to color and looking for where it belongs. Mm -hmm. So that helps a lot. And then, of course, you also you ha do have a transfer underneath that's helping yeah. maintain your shapes. Um, so hopefully, Sandra, that also answers your question there. Um, yes, Dark Star Snowstorm. How did I protect the canvas? So, well, I had the, the canvas in my bag, so it was protected from water until it was time to paint it. And then you have to 
paint it very quickly. <laughs> um, because of course the snow will get on it and then it'll become wet and then the wet, the water won't uh, play well with the oil. And so then you have to compensate with, because then as you're painting, there's water getting on the canvas and so you have to just, I would just work more quickly or, and, and also more thickly. And I, I will add that it didn't come out very nice. Um, <laughs> But it was fun. It was quite the experience. Typically, when I go plein air painting, I do it purely for fun with zero intention of making a nice painting, but 100% just to enjoy being out there in the elements and um, being able to create in the midst of it all. It was pretty cool. I went with a friend, and he brought a, uh, a hot kettle of tea, which quickly became lukewarm. <laughs> it was a good time. Yeah, the dexterity definitely goes out the window in the cold. Um, and you kind of just ex ex expect, because you're going to be working quickly and shaky, that you'll probably get some paint on your gloves. So. I would wear sort of like secondhand gloves, uh, snow gloves, and so yeah, no dexterity whatsoever. Very impressionistic, perhaps abstract. Very Picasso. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> but coming back to Alex's question. Oh boy. So it's going to be the same question except for one word. Mm. So this is another question for everybody. What is your process? for channeling motivation. Do you create it or does it come to you? In this world, it's either create or get created. <laughs> I, was gonna, I thought you were gonna say like, do you create or does it create you? Oh. <laughs> I was like, Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a goal. I have a life that I want to live and for the rest of my life. And so it means a lot to me. And that's what keeps me going. Um, you know, I'm human too. I get tired. I get moody and tired at the same time. That's like never good. <laughs> and yeah, sometimes, and I have a hard time knowing when to take a break sometimes. Um, but I think overall, I'm just motivated by knowing what I want. Um, and that is like a very like macro sort of mindset. It's like the rest of my life. Um, and so that generally keeps me going like really hard. Um, and usually I don't, I don't like complain about painting. Um, when I'm tired, I just say I'm like tired because I know the work I've done and I know I've spent energy and time and I'm just acknowledging it. Like, yes, that took a lot out of me. Um, but I'm never like, oh, I like, I'm so tired like of painting, like tired like of being an artist or like anything like that. Like, I mean, sometimes there are days where I'm like, I don't want to like think about this anymore. I don't want to like wake up and like automatically like schedule my day around painting and my week around painting. And like sometimes it feels like I'm just like running in circles around this one thing. Um, but like, you know, that's like in my own control. And at the end of the day, like I know it's what I'm committed to. And so I don't really have trouble like staying motivated because I know where I want to be. Um, and so it's just like constant for me. Um, the only thing that kind of waxes and, waxes and wanes is just energy levels. But that's because I'm like a person. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. You've got goals. That certainly helps. I have goals. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not painting into the ether, hopefully. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, curious to hear everyone else's uh, responses to that as well. Sandra said, I just start and let it flow. Glenn said, have to create it. Nicholas said, fear is a good motivator too. Like huh. if I don't keep doing it, my skills will get stale. Yeah, that's definitely in the mix there too with me. <laughs> Darkstar said, when it comes to staying motivated, I make sure to take time to paint what I want, what makes me curious with no expectations. 
Yeah. That was very important. Um, this, this week on Thursday, for the first time in like a little over a year, I would say, I painted something for fun. <laughs> and so that was really, really nice. Uh, really needed that. Um, Want to share it with us? Sure. I'd be happy nice. to share with you guys. <laughs> Yeah, I'll go grab it. OK. Stay tuned. May is wandering around the, the school looking for her painting. Yeah, definitely Dark Star. And that goes back to how I tend to enjoy plein air painting. Um, it just centers me and reminds me what art is all about and um, just being surrounded by incredible art of nature and then being able to create it myself. It just, it's so good. We are still looking for this painting. So just bear with us. <laughs> We did not realize this would, uh, we didn't know that this painting was running away from us. Who knows, maybe these things have legs. Could it, could it be right over there? the gray uh, backside underneath on the other side like under that easel look further down and then through the easel like on the shelf? no look down on the floor no. yeah no. Oh. hmm oh, oh okay I'm so silly. all right I'm back <laughs> we found it this little master copy um, in like one awesome. sitting. That was fun. And you probably can't see it from here, but like there's like a lot of texture from the paint. And um, I just had a really, I just had a really good time. <laughs> um, I like started off by mixing colors for the background. And then I realized that Can I could just- tilt it down just a little yeah. bit? Yeah. Right there. I realized that like a lot of- Actually step back just like here? a little bit right there. Yeah. Thank you. Like, all the colors in, like, the figures are just, like, more saturated versions of colors in the background. So it was really fun just, like, repurposing them. Um, it was also nice because this piece is, like, small. So I could just, like, hold it and work on it instead of, like, standing and, like, sitting back down and, like, moving around and stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. It's really nice. I really like the red shadows <laughs> just tucked in into some of those spots in the faces. Really nice. Mental health painting. Yeah, mental health painting. Mental health painting. Okay. Time to perform for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Feeling motivated. <laughs> uh, and then like the day after I spent like like five hours like, you know, back on portfolio stuff. I was just like painting a shirt and pants and I was just like, <laughs> I miss the armor and the wings. It's okay. I, I forgot where it was. <laughs> oh, Mary Jo, so um, the original artist, so that was a master copy of a Bougaro. No. It was a Solomon, Sorry, yes. Solomon J. Solomon. Thank you, Solomon yeah. J. Solomon of St. Saint, Saint George. I, I don't know what it was called. Then. <laughs> um, Maybe, if you I know Google that he's him, stabbing though? a dragon. It's not in the painting, but he is stabbing a dragon. Mm. If you go? look up Solomon J. Solomon, it is, it is like the first painting that comes up. Okay. I did that because I was like, hmm, maybe I should do more master copies of this guy. And then it was just like five in a row of like this one painting on Google Images. And I was like, okay.
Okay, we've got a couple questions. Mm -hmm. This one's from Nicholas. Yes. So let's say that you painted something that you thought was great in a single pass, mm -hmm. and then the next day you're like, no, that's horrible. What do you do? I work on it until I feel like it's not horrible. Or if it's just like a casual piece, then I'm like, okay. And then I figure out why I think it's horrible. And then I'm like, I'll like try to remember that going to the next piece. Be like, okay, you know what you thought was horrible. Make this one less horrible or not horrible. <laughs> I guess that's it. Um, not, not super insightful. <laughs> so then, well then follow up question to that. Yeah. If you're trying to figure out why do you have difficulty figuring out why it's horrible or, or like how do you identify what the problems are and then go ahead and address them well usually it'll be like um like one part of the painting that's kind of throwing you off um that's like usually the case i would think um so you kind of look closely more at that section you're like what is wrong here and um Sometimes it helps to like turn it upside down next to the reference and then kind of make the shapes abstract so you can kind of see the kind of fundamentals more clearly. So values, edges, and colors. Um, and then usually it's one of those elements that's acting up a little. Um, so kind of just distance yourself from the painting, um, like at least from the subjects of the painting, so you don't like kind of have expectations of what something's supposed to look like, you know, especially if it's like a face or an animal or something like that. Um, and then kind of go through the fundamentals and see which one is missing in different areas. Usually that works out pretty well. Daniel likes to hold his paintings and look in the mirror, which is like kind of the same thing, but it's cooler. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, that's, I will only do that, I do that a little bit cautiously, because mm. you, you actually can only do it a certain amount of times before the mirror itself. Um, it becomes familiar as well. Yeah. Right. yeah. But I'll, so I'll, I'll, only, I'll only do it when I've already exhausted <laughs> um, a lot, of, well, not options, because it always comes back to values, edges, and color. Mm -hmm. um, but when I just can't, when I know that I'm not seeing the painting as it currently is, like I, you, be, you can become blind to the painting, mm -hmm. and I feel like I can become blind to my own paintings quicker than maybe the average artist. I don't know. So I will try to psych myself out. Um, but also, I think the nature of doing or. Um, like, I'm often making paintings that I have to sort of invent while I'm painting it. Mm -hmm. And and so I'm, I tend to be more concerned about the overall impression. Right. Like, I don't have, my reference is rarely ever perfect. And so I have to solve problems. I have to kind of fill in the gaps between what, what I have for my reference and then what I want the painting to be. And so that first impression needs to convince the viewers that it works. Um, but, I've, but I'm already way past the first impression, right? So I'll use the mirror to sort of check like, okay, is this first impression convincing viewers that what I'm trying to express is, is if it's working? And so, yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, cool. <laughs> I'll make sure the, the essence of the painting is intact. Yeah. Because once that first impression is there, um, then like the painting could be on the impressionistic side, it could be realistic, um, but and it would all be kind of fine. But it's really that first impression um, that is there to convince you. Mm -hmm. Okay, question from Mary Jo. Yes. Do you have a trick to making paintings, uh, to making a blurred edge when you come up to an already dry background or area? There is no trick. There is only remix the colors and paint it. That's my experience. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's, there's no shortcut. There's no like, ah, here's a magic medium that will 
like undry the paint so I can paint on it directly. No, you just have to do it. Go back into the trenches and put out your paint. I don't like doing it either, but um, it's necessary. Yeah. <laughs> I will say, to my amazement, that I have seen Kevin do it without mixing the color. Well, he cheats. No, I'm kidding. I don't know what he does. <laughs> <laughs> wow, calling him out. <laughs> no, okay, well, I wouldn't know how that If works. it works, it's certainly not cheating, but mm -hmm. I think it's honestly, um, he just has so much experience that he has the perfect consistency of paint for the spot that he's working in mm -hmm. with a very deft hand that's... Um, so delicate, the the brush itself is creating like a fade yeah. that is so soft and smooth that it appears to be as if it was um, like the great as if it was made on wet on wet. Like I've, he actually um, did it in the sci-fi painting. Really? And oh um, yeah, like the the velvet edge thing that he was like yeah, obsessed yeah. with. Okay, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we talked about it uh, after the live yeah. stream was over. Yeah. Um, we took all, we all took a close look at it, and we're kind of ooing and aahing over it. I wasn't. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, there's there's a, a few fine. moments after the live stream happens, and because I'm only seeing this, I'm seeing this in the same way that you guys are, right, with through the screens, and uh, it's always fun to kind of take a closer look mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, get to appreciate it in person. So there's a few times where. Kevin and I are sort of nerding out over some subtle trick or technique that he pulled off. And sometimes no one really, none of the viewers noticed that he did that, mm -hmm. which is also kind of fun. <laughs> but yeah, we'll, we'll talk about it. Kevin is a paint whisperer, I'm convinced, from Dark Star. <laughs> yeah, I guess if you have exactly the right amount of glaze in exactly the right consistency and exactly the right color, then you could just like do that. But I feel like, at least for me at this point, it just takes so much trial and error. I'd rather just like have something exact that I know I'm aiming for in terms of like an opaque and just do it that way. Yeah. I'm not cool enough. Sorry, guys. <laughs> That would be nice, though. <laughs> Are the colors you're painting now considered darkest lights? Yeah. Maybe not darkest. Darker, moderate. I think I already put in most of my darkest lights. And they're actually, like, they're just like very, very light shadows where like the wings kind of, they like overlap each other like very slightly like this. And so there was like little bits of cast shadow or, and they're a little translucent so you can kind of see like one a little bit underneath the other some places. So that creates some variation too. At this point, I think I'm just, like I have all my landmarks in, but I'm just gonna start painting in like really distinct feathers, I think. So I like, really know where everything is, because right now it's still a little bit of a mess. Um, it's just harder to read. Oh, I just saw this yeah. when you were sharing your very nice Solomon J. Solomon study. <laughs> Darkstar said, "Oh, she's glowing, talking about it. Smiley face, smiley <laughs> oh, face, she's crying happy. face, crying face." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It just it just felt really nice to like do something for fun and like not be super hyper focused on like rendering super super well and smoothly and. Um, and to just like finish something within like a day, cause like all my pieces take at least like 
between like two weeks and like a month, so I'm kind of just like hammering at it. And it's not like I, you know, it's it's not like I don't enjoy painting just because it like takes longer or anything. Um, but there's just like a satisfaction in just like kind of just like using your skills and just it like working out, and you can kind of just get like instant feedback for something. Um, Oh, that's very blue. That actually looks kind of cool. I kind of like it. Hmm. Maybe too much. Maybe decisions, I'll, decisions. I think I'll glaze it in if I like it, but I don't want to be stuck with it. Um, there's like a gremlin on my shoulder. Like, make the wings blue. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> I can make a poll for you if you want. Oh my God. Let the masses decide. <laughs> Democracy, you could. And then it'd be up to me to listen or not. That'd be funny. They're, they're really not that blue. Um, now it's just more of like a neutral gray, but since everything else is warm, it reads as blue. It's all relative. It's all relative. Question from Nicholas. Mm -hmm. Any nerdy tricks for painting on gessoed boards? This is my second one, and I'm learning by doing. Lifting paint was a problem at the beginning. Hmm. Yeah, I think if you're used to working on canvas, you're used to kind of applying the paint more with more force because you need to like fill in all like the nooks and crannies of the texture and stuff. It takes a while to get used to how, how nice and smooth gesso is. Um, I would say, I don't know, I've been working on panel for like a very, very long time, so I'm kind of, I'm very like used to it at this point. Um, probably, like a lot of the same tricks as canvas really, like make sure your paint density is like consistent. Um, I think maybe with canvas, like you can get away with like a little more medium in your paint because it might like absorb a little bit more, but like with gesso, you'll just be kind of like skating all over the place if you have like even a little bit too much medium. Um, yeah, experience is definitely the best teacher. Like, mm -hmm. I don't, it's, I don't think I've worked on canvas in, since like 2019, since like when I was like painting in quarantine. Yeah, I stole a few like, canvas panels from the school so I could keep painting at home. Um, that was a long time ago. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Let Make experience sure you, do the teaching. Mm -hmm. Make Thank sure you, you sand your panels before you work and then wipe off all the dust. <laughs> Sometimes, there was this one time I think I forgot to like wipe off a lot of the dust and that was like not fun to work on in some parts. But that's just like common sense stuff. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, experience. Definitely more valuable to you than whatever I'm saying. <laughs> yes, Mary Jo, um, sand. All right, well, after you you're gonna wanna gesso it, and then you would sand it after you gesso it. See that blue speaking back in? Mm -hmm. I, I'm getting pretty fond of it, actually. Oh, that's, that's very strong. <laughs> it doesn't look very strong on the camera if it makes you feel any better. Really? Mm-hmm. But, you know, trust your own eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Am I? Um, okay, so I'm getting more questions about gessoing boards and stuff. So first, let me say that there's a lot of different products out there. And 
I don't know what products you have. And so much better to follow instructions from whatever company or product you're using. And maybe at some point we'll have a YouTube video about, you know, how to take a board, gesso it, sand it down and everything. But if you are purchasing a pre-gessoed board, then you should not need to sand it down, uh, typically. Mm -hmm. But again, just to clarify, I don't know what products you're using or what you have. So um, for the sake of your own sanity, do not consider me to be an expert with whatever it is that you have or what process you should, you should be following. Um, and I think that's important, right? Like, mm -hmm. always be a little bit skeptical. Um, it's very easy, you because we're kind of on this little live stream here. Very easy for me to take my assumptions about what you might be using or what you have, and then just tell you what to do. Um, and then if you take that information, it could lead to a disaster potentially. So it kind of just comes back to the importance of having a guide, someone who's really following you. And this is actually one of the reasons why in the Evolve program, we provide all the art materials to all of our students so that we know exactly what they're using and we can give very specific instructions about it. But this is a little case with this whole gesso thing where um, I'm starting to realize I shouldn't be telling you guys what to do about it. Um. Yeah, so Mary, I'm gonna stick to my guns and just say, um, look it up online. Um, but my opinion, and again, I don't know, I don't have all the information that you have about what you have, <laughs> but um, if you have ampersand gesso board, then it's probably ready to paint on. Mm -hmm. That is also the extent of my knowledge. <laughs> so, in the same boat as Daniel. Two, one, two, three, four. <laughs> uh, figuring out which feather I'm working on. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, that's correct. Very good.
what is this? <laughs> I'm trying to figure out what I did earlier. Uh, to be connected question mark oh yeah yeah <laughs> um, yeah so I put down like a lot of lines and some of those lines are like between the feathers and some of those lines are like the the thing like in the middle of the feather like I don't know the stem that is definitely not scientifically correct but it's what I think of the math so I just mixed up one of those but it's okay It's gonna look so nice once I put in like the actual lights, like the extreme lights and stuff. I promise. This is all in shadow. Um, Dark Star, to answer your question, so MDF board, um, I h had to look that up because I'm not actually familiar with that, but it appears to be like a recycled wood fiber board, which seems to be different from what we use. So I would recommend that you follow up with whoever recommended that you use that and get your answer there. We use a kind of uh, masonite board from a hardware store that is similar but it doesn't quite look like wood in the same way that the MDF looks like at least from the images I saw. Um, either way my opinion and only my opinion would be that you should be sanding it down between each layer of gesso. Okay, masonite. Yeah, so with, with masonite, then sand it down with each layer of gesso. So the reason, again, there's, there's, there's so many things to, to your process, Darkstar, that I'm not aware of. But um, depending on how you're applying it, chances are that there's going to be a tooth, like a, a certain level of texture that is happening as you're rolling it on. Um, and so because of that tooth, it's going to be, that, that texture is going to be kind of too up and down for the paint. And so it's going to make it harder to fill whereas a light sanding is going to smooth it down enough. Um, so yeah, so there's the, the why behind it. But again, I can't see what you're doing or what process you're following. And so 
you might want to reach out to us on Instagram or reach out on a one-on-one -on -one call and try to get a more clear answer where we can really kind of walk you through that. Since you're a student with the Evolve program, much better to ask those questions there um, since kind of on a live stream here. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the best place because I'm, I'd, we'd kind of want to do like a, some, maybe a video chat or something or a phone call and we could walk you through the entire process. That way you can just follow the instructions and then ask questions for each thing. I think at this point, I'm just going to start filling everything else with pretty much like the value of the co like just one color that will represent like all the lights. And I'm going to start with this one and it's just supposed to match the flats. Um, and I'll probably alternate between this and the one next to it. This is like a cooler, slightly lighter version. So I'll just start with this very small um, value range for now and then probably use these two later as kind of highlights. Um, see where this goes. <laughs> I think I have enough down where putting this color in can start making sense. All right, May, you ready for another question from me? Yeah, go for it. All righty. What is the hardest part of making a painting? Um, I guess, like, deciding when it's done, I think, at least for me. Um, I have this increasingly crippling... Uh, perfectionistic streak <laughs> and sometimes it's hard to know when to stop but at the same time that's like coupled with the desire to like create paintings at like a fast rate so it's like I really want to finish but also I really want something to be the best it can be so a lot of times I'm left finishing paintings like with mistakes 
or like places that I know I could have done better. But luckily, like like these days, like the number of those places that I usually leave a painting with, like places I could do better, is like dwindling like a lot. So that's good. Um, a part of a painting that I dislike doing the most is probably the transfer, because these days, like most of my paintings are big, so it just it just hurts <laughs> and takes up a lot of time. Um, but yeah, I think for me, like finishing a painting is the most difficult and then the least enjoyable is like the transfer. <laughs> And then also like putting down flats is sometimes really annoying, um, especially if the painting is like really big. So you're just kind of like mixing like a stupid amount of paint and then just like spreading it out evenly. And then it's just like, oh, uh, it's just like when will it end, you know? Like, <laughs> this is such a big panel for what? Um, but actually rendering and like making things look like things is like nice. So once you mm -hmm. get, I guess like starting and finishing a painting is like the hardest. <laughs> Um, yeah. For me. Mm -hmm. Sandra said, remembering to slow down and take my time. Valid. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sarah said, worrying I won't execute it well. Makes it hard to get started sometimes. Yeah, that's a real fear. Fear of the blank canvas. I think we've talked about that. Yeah. It gets harder as you go. <laughs> <laughs> But also, as you, as you continue to go, you'll also have more. You'll also be better. Yeah, you'll have you'll be better. You'll have more of a history of overcoming that challenge every time, mm -hmm. which does also help. So it might feel like an even harder mountain to climb, but you can remind yourself, I've been here before. It's been hard to start before, but I've gotten it. through this before, yeah. and I can get through it again. You know. Mm -hmm. Alex said, "To be honest, mixing colors." It gets so tedious sometimes. Oh, I love mixing colors. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so silly. That's an acquired taste. <laughs> Alex said, and eventually you just get the urge to, to get started, even if the colors aren't perfect. Uh-oh. It's a recipe for disaster. <laughs> that sounds like heresy to me. <laughs> but I do relate to the feeling. Yeah, I feel like I've spent enough time around Kevin where, like... He has this thing where it's like, if you hear the voice in your head going like, it's good enough, when you like, know it's not good enough, you like, can never listen to it. Um, otherwise you should be like, violently ashamed of yourself. So, <laughs> I feel like that's just like, cooked into my brain at this point. <laughs> violently ashamed of yourself? Is this <laughs> okay. why you need mental, mental health paintings? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe. No, I'm kidding. Um, you doing okay, May? <laughs> <laughs> deep dive um, but it, I mean I've, I think I've mentioned this before it's like the idea of like of, um, thank you yeah <laughs> like if you're not doing your best and you know it you're kind of sabotaging your own work and wasting your own time so it's like why would you do that mm -hmm. um, and it's better to invest more time into something you know is a good product or will have a good outcome than to invest less time and go into something knowing that you're like screwing it up anyway so um, yeah yeah. If it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. Exactly. If you're going to do it, do it right. Yeah. Sandra said, coming back the next day and seeing it differently than the day before, it's like starting from scratch. Make sure you seal it before you look at it again, because that can really <laughs> get to your head. Yeah. Um, yeah. I used to get like really hung up on how my paintings look like when they were sealed. I was like, all the colors gone. I spent so much time mixing it. I would be like, calm down. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. <laughs> I felt like I said the, the violently ashamed thing with too much of a straight face. That's just like my sense of humor. Sorry, I don't mean to concern you guys. <laughs> I'm okay, I promise. Just. <laughs> <laughs> Drink your coffee. <laughs> That's always good to know. I'm glad you're okay. You're just joking around. <laughs> Thanks, Daniel. <laughs> For me, I find that 
the hardest part is um, is getting to the finish line um, because it's not a finish line. It's a dot. Mm. It's a singular point. And in general, I tend to have difficulty of making up my mind with things. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if I have this cool, ins you know, inspirational idea and I want to express it and get it out, I want to make sure that, like, everything is there. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, is that you can't have everything there because it's one image. You know, it's not moving. Mm -hmm. um, it can't do two things at once necessarily, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so just kind of like finding that, that point and saying this is where I want to stop and being confident about stopping there, mm -hmm. especially when like the ideas that you have about the painting are so much more than the painting itself, you know. So I don't know if that, if that makes sense, but it's like... No, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Accepting the limitations of like a 2D image. Yeah, because like this painting that I'm working on now, like with this boat and everything, like I'm imagining it in this, in this space and I can kind of like look at it from every angle, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I want people to be able to see it from every angle just like I do, when in reality, it's only being shown from one angle. And mm -hmm. so um, if the painting can invite the viewers to enter into a space where they could do that with their own imagination, then I think that would be, that's a successful painting. Um, but yeah, so sometimes I just, even towards the end, I can't quite make up my mind. It's like, I thought I knew what I wanted, but then somewhere <laughs> along the way of this journey, things like came along and I was inspired in other subtle different ways. And now maybe I want the painting to look like this. And, mm -hmm. and so just coming to that finality point. So bright, wow. We're saving that for later. <laughs> well, look at that, wow. <laughs> Get out, go away. Oh, that's, that's exciting. <laughs> that, that feather stroke you just put in? Oh, yeah, you see how bright that is? I do. Can they see how bright yes, that is? Yes, they can. That's crazy. But like on the palette, it's like gray, you know, but it reads like bright white. That's so crazy. Yeah, you gotta trust it, trust your palette. That's so enjoyable. That's also bright. Oh, I think because it's mixing. It's okay. I should probably wipe that out. It's like a very dense stroke. So can you point to the palette of which one this is? That was this. Not even that, this. Imagine <laughs> what this is going to do. That's going to go crazy. Pretty crazy, right? I mean, that, that mixture is darker than the palette itself. Yeah, literally. So you've got quite a range available to you. You see, I'm like grinning like a maniac. I'm like, oh, look at that. <laughs> Look at that range. That's crazy. Um, yeah. <laughs> so does that alter that. some things for you, just seeing that, realizing that that's how, how far up you're going to go? Um, or are you going to knock it down intentionally? I'm going to definitely like not touch this at all. <laughs> um, not good. touch which one? The blue one? Yeah, the really bright blue one. Mm -hmm. um, well, maybe in like like two places or something, because that'd be crazy. Um, but I thought this would be. These two are like pretty close, but I think I thought that these two were closer than they were, and like there's kind of a jump between here. So I think we're gonna have to like make an make another mixture of like a cooler version of this, because I thought this was gonna function that way, but these two are too close, and this is obviously like insanely bright. So I'm about to make another version of this. Um, that is cooler. This is still warm, and I have to keep putting blue in it, which is like getting annoying, so I might just mix something. Put it here. This. Question from Sandra. Yes. May, does your painting ever look different than you expected and have to adjust on the fly? If so, what are your thoughts on it? Yes, I've been doing that this like entire time. My thoughts, it's fun. Um, and it's a nice way to kind of like 
challenge like what you're able to come up with on the spot and like just like problem solve like for three hours straight. Um, so it could be fun, but sometimes if it doesn't work out after you try fixing the same thing like three times in a row, then you can get a little bit shaken. But um, that's where just like experience and um, like confidence that is derived from that experience becomes very valuable. It's very blue. But yeah, nothing wrong with experimenting. Um, it's a very good way to learn. Sarah said those light feathers are going to look so amazing against the dark sky. I know. <laughs> I didn't realize how dark this painting was overall until like that moment where I put down like this color. Straight up blinded. All right, let's do a little bit lighter and warmer. So I think that should be good. I could have just like combined like these two colors probably and then made it darker, but I don't want to run out of those two. So we're just doing it this way. And maybe a little lighter. Just a little lighter. It's better to add like little amounts of something and then just having to add a lot of it, like just having to add it a bunch of times, then adding like a big amount and then having to add like a huge amount of like every other color you mix into it later um, to compensate for it, at least in my experience. You'd be curious to, if you take a little bit of that and compare it against the original mixture for us to see the value difference. Oh yeah. Okay, yeah, so it's just a little bit darker. Mm -hmm. A lot cooler, though. So this works. If it doesn't, I'll make it work. It's fine. Yeah. I'm pleased. Okay. <laughs> it's still, like, a little bit of a jump, but um, it could be subdued pretty easily. Um, there's, like, a lot of variation up there anyway, so I don't mind mixing. Question for you from Nicholas. Mm -hmm. What learning experience stands out in your mind, May? Like something that was an aha moment, if you have one. Uh, thinking about it. I feel like I don't explicitly have aha moments, it's just like, sometimes I'll be doing something and then I'll remember that there's like a better way to do it or that I've done something similar before. And so like the experience really jumps out to me in my head, but not really as like a learning experience, just as like an experience as a reference point. But I guess that is what like learning is. Um, I have one. Go for it. <laughs> yeah, so I was coming up to the end of my full-time program under Kevin Murphy, and I was working, um, we were basically doing uh, puddling paintings, that's block seven in the Evolve program, um, and they were figure paintings, actually really similar to what May is doing now, just without wings. Mm -hmm. And I was, I think I was on my third or fourth or something and I man how do I compile this into words <laughs> I, like creating the context here 
I was starting to realize, because so I'm painting these, you know, these these human figures, and I was beginning to see the subtle temperature shifts in their skin, and it, you know, it was, it was very, very subtle in the in the photograph that I was working from. But I found that if I accentuated the colors that I saw and put them in, that it looked better. The painting seemed to be more alive. And um, I also, at the same, while I was kind of playing around with that, kind of coming around to this idea, I also, um, the, the, just the, the, the painting that I was working on, that had this, this arm that was kind of further off in the distance. And, you know, originally you would, I could use like less color to make it go further back. I could use um, blurred edges to make it go further back because this, this arm is like more in the distance compared to the other one. Um, or I could use diminished values. And I simply decided to keep those, all those three things basically to the same level as everything else. In other words, like my painting was going to be flatter. I don't know if this is making sense. No, but I decided <laughs> instead to paint it in a more impressionistic and choppy manner while the front of the painting was done more realistically. And so I just, I just wanted to play with it, and I, and I did that, and it actually came out really, really nice. And I, I did use some values and edges, and you could say that the edges were kind of being softened in some ways by being more impressionistic. Um, but just the, the separation between the impressionistic style and the realistic style helped create enough of a separation to say that one thing was further back than the other. And so that I was, I was kind of chewing on that idea, and then I remember jumping into this this new painting, and I thought, you know what, I'm just gonna push the limits, like on every on, on every like thing available to me, and I just start painting it, and you know I'm seeing like these subtle colors, and I'm just putting down like the the most colorful colorful version of that color I possibly could, and. And it feels like I'm making these really scary decisions, but it was coming together so beautifully, and it really just, like, the painting was just glowing and singing, and it was kind of just this eureka moment of realizing that in art, everything does come down to relationships, and everything is related to each other, and by elevating all of the colors at once in every area, um, the, all of the colors were still working in harmony together, but it just looked like a more colorful painting. And then on top of that, I was also beginning to realize, well, if the whole painting is colorful, then maybe none of it is. So maybe I have some areas in the painting that are less colorful intentionally to bring out the higher saturated areas. And so it's like relationships on top of relationships and all mm -hmm. the edges. And it was kind of just this moment where I was like, oh my goodness, like <laughs> I, I, I kind of, I felt like I, I just, I got it. I had like unlocked something. Right. And I just felt so much appreciation for, um, yeah, like I don't know how to describe it, but that, that moment just like, it completely changed how I see art now. And um, now like if, even if I was gonna be using like other tools that I hadn't used before, I'd feel like I now know to look for how do I create like a, a relationship between one thing and another. Um, I feel like it's even improved my ability with like tasting food and like <laughs> hearing music and just appreciating like how one thing can create harmony with another thing. And it's so hard to describe, but. It's cross modality. It, it, yeah. That's pretty cool. I actually have no idea what that word is. It's like um, <laughs> across multiple senses. So yeah. You said like music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, definitely. Taste, so. So it kind of like, it's almost like um, when you become a master of one thing, you become a master of them all. It was sort of like that, that moment. And uh, yeah, but it's truly, it's, it's not something that I can just say in words and then you hear it and then it, that, Makes like the sense. same level of aha, aha it's not going to happen here over this live stream because it has to be like your moment, your experience where it just it goes beyond the words and it just resonates like really deeply. And it, it's just like, kind of like everything just clicked. 
and it felt so good and so mm -hmm. liberating. And I felt like I felt like I could paint anything. anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I was just ecstatic. I had like a little moment like that when I was painting that smaller piece from the other day where I was like all the background colors or just all the colors in the foreground just more colorful and that was cool. But yeah nothing quite quite so life life changing I think yet. I don't know. <laughs> and even like um like I found myself doing some like graphic design stuff, like, you know, mm -hmm. basic web design tasks, like here and there. Mm -hmm. And somehow, like the decisions that I'm making about those things seemingly unrelated are 100% related to that eureka mm -hmm. moment <laughs> from the painting, just understanding the relationships. And actually, this is like one of my, I'm just going to, this idea just came to me and I want to share it. It's also crazy. Part of, part of this, this whole Eureka moment is like, you know, these relationships go beyond just art, as I've already kind of mentioned with like the senses and stuff. But like, it really feels as if our whole world is like, we're like in some sort of ocean, right? Like we have sound waves, radio waves, light waves. Mm -hmm. who knows what other kinds of waves you know like mm -hmm. and and they they pass through each other somehow without interfering with each other to our knowledge and to me that just like blows my mind like and I remember learning in I took, took like an environmental science course in high school and one of the things that they were explaining was just how vulnerable the ocean always was it's like if something happens in one place then you see the effects of it, like on the other side of the world. Mm -hmm. And even to apply that simple idea to this world that we live in of like, well, gosh, if, if like this very space that we're in right now has these waves of like things bouncing off and resonating mm -hmm. and then creating some sort of harmony with other things, I don't know, it's just more than my brain can handle. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just really, really cool and really beautiful to me. It makes me happy. Like, you know, here we are doing this live stream. Everyone here is, you know, interested in watching this. And this is sort of like the world of, like, of all the relationships within the world of art. Mm -hmm. But there's so many other passions, so many other interests that all have their own kinds of relationships. Right. Like sports. Like, you know, the relationship between the foot and the soccer ball or something, and how much mm -hmm. power you're using versus the angle that you hit it on and mm -hmm. what kind of spin that you're giving it, like this all is. of these subtle delicacy, delicate things. And it's just like a never, it just, I don't know, it's just like a never ending. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you, Alex. This discussion is ascending, <laughs> lol. I'm a I'm a simple painter. <laughs> I have nothing yeah. to offer. Yeah, <laughs> if I wasn't gonna... painting and I was just sitting around <laughs> thinking, then like, yeah. But... The ice is melting because I'm not drinking it. And it's so watered down. Coming along. I'm adding blue because I feel like it. Um, Thank like you for it. bringing us back to Earth, May. I appreciate it. <laughs> Sorry to drag you back down. <laughs> no, no, it's good, it's good. It needs to happen. You can get lost up there or down there, wherever lost in the there is. Yeah. You should do like fireside chats. Just like ascending conversations. <laughs>
So are you leaving some areas with the that red undertone underneath? Are you going to leave it in some places? Or this will stuff? you, yeah, will everything get covered? I think I'll cover it. Um, but yeah, right now it's functioning as a good like placeholder for lights in general. Um, mm -hmm. And it tells me like what value I need to make other things like relative to it. Because it's kind of the darkest light. So it's really close to a lot of the stuff. Um, that overlaps with the arm. And then based on that relationship, I can kind of gouge how the lights should look relative to that, like once it's past the arm. Serves more functional than aesthetic purpose. <laughs> I think that's a snazzy way to say it. <laughs> yeah, Mary Jo said, my biggest aha moment was realizing that neutral grays are essential to bring out intense colors close to them. Yeah, exactly. True. Because that's another relationship. Yes. <laughs> but don't worry, I've, I've got an anchor now. <laughs> I'm not going to go floating off again. <laughs> Sarah said, I think we can all relate to that feeling, though, Daniel. It's the muse that keeps us wanting to do this. Yeah. The muse? What does that mean? The muse? I mean, I know what a muse is, but like, the muse? Or... Well, it's like a... It's her Just way of... like, in general? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's the compelling force, you could, you could say. It's the force. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What, Avatar, uh, Last Airbender? The chakras. And now here we are at Star Wars? <sighs> we're just wandering, we're just into the, into the conversational weeds. <laughs> To the thick of it. <laughs> this is this is working. I keep telling myself this is working. What time is it? Oh, it is eight fifty. Oh, stop. Mm, that's that's not comfortable. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Nicholas said, "Now I want to make a painting with no relationships, just to be different." See, but that's the problem, Nicholas. All images built on relationships. Even the very definition of different has. Re relationships <sighs> built into it. So true. So, unfortunately, <laughs> it's all... Daniel's connected. trying to say you lose in the nicest <laughs> way possible. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that is a very big, like, life lesson. Just in general, like, Okay, if we're all just floating, we can just all float together. And like, <laughs> <laughs> like a lot of people will like grow up in general. I think like this is just a common experience. It's like you want to be like different from everyone around you, or you know, unique in some way, known for something. But, um, like you know, as Daniel just said, if you define yourself as being like different, that's still relative to everyone else, and so you're not really anything. You're just like a null version of something else. You're just like not something instead of like actually something. Um. And so it's kind of recursive. There's like that saying, like, if you don't stand for anything, you'll fall for anything, which is pretty powerful, too. But that's, like, almost political, so I'm going to stop. It's like, he who stands for nothing will fall for anything. Mm -hmm. And that's why we teach the Foundations <laughs> in the Evolve program. <laughs> that's why we're all gathered here today. <laughs> so that when you are painting, you have... Uh, you have foundations to hold on to. That's right. So that your painting doesn't go floating away. Yeah. But you can take the painting in the direction that you want to go. There we go. Yeah. We brought it back. We're so good at this. <laughs> you didn't think of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I feel. So you're feeling the time pressure now? A little bit. A little, a little bit. bit. It's 
okay, though. It's been worse. <laughs> <laughs> I think once, like, um, the first time I asked for a time check, it was really like 9.30 or something. I was like, whoa. That wasn't <laughs> fun. Really sneaks up on you. Pretty sure time is relative too, but that one goes beyond my brain, so. Yeah, I'm not an expert. Comment down below if you're an expert in time travel. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone can explain interstellar? No, literally. Everyone's like, whoa, that movie was so good. I was like, I, I don't. Yeah, it was enjoyable. I don't, I don't know how anything worked. But <laughs> also I was like, I don't know, like 14. So I'm going to cut myself some slack. <laughs> it's coming along. <laughs> I don't know, is it? <laughs> I think the rest is like, it's all pretty much just one color. I'm just applying one color and blending it into what's down already. Sort of yeah, it's just one color, man. You're fine. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the soundtrack was amazing. For Interstellar? Mm-hmm. I think, like, my mom cried, or, like, someone next to me was crying. I don't even know if it was my mom or not, but we watched it in theaters, so someone next to me was crying, and then I saw them crying, and then, like, I started crying just because they were crying, and I was like, I don't even know what's going on. <laughs> Why am I upset? <laughs> it's the power of love being the fifth dimension. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that's what that movie was about. But Actually, I don't know. I well, I don't know about it being the fifth dimension, but it was definitely about love. That's true. I would say it was more about love than it was about time and space. Yeah. I feel like good, good stories do that. They're sort mm -hmm. of like, okay, let's sort of create like a scene here and like make it really interesting and cool, but then like talk about something with like, I don't know, something completely else, you know? Yeah, it re recontextualizes the familiar and powerful. Right. Like, um, another one is the movie About Time. And if you say, like, oh, yeah, that's a movie about time travel, mm -hmm. it doesn't really describe what that movie is about at right. all. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, yes, it includes time travel, but that wasn't the point. Right. It was the vehicle of the narrative. Exactly. Yeah, there you go, Alex. Something about love permeating time and space. We're just saying things. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's I think that's what it was about. So true. Whether that is, but it's okay. <clears throat> May, do you happen to know who James Cag Cagney is? 
No. Me neither. Is someone asking about him? Not exactly. Is he okay? <laughs> <laughs> I think he's, I imagine he's quite fine. Is he, is he like someone asking something in the chat? Or... Yeah. It's okay. I don't know who you are. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> One of the benefits of being on this side of the screen mm -hmm. is that I know everything that's happening. If you think about it, May actually can't hear. Like, I don't know what you guys like are she saying. Like, can't, yeah, she can't hear what you guys are saying. It's getting Daniel's version. Right. You know, this is literally 1984. Like, what? <laughs> There's no proper communication. There's just the broadcast from Daniel and Big Brother. It's... Wow, I'm Big Brother? I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> I'm joking. Like, my friend group has this bit where we, like, every time something doesn't go our way, we just go, like, this is literally 1984. <laughs> and it's like, uh, it's funny to us. Maybe we take the novel too lightly. So, so, since we're on this subject, uh -huh. you um, like what do you imagine in your head when you're talking to the camera, May? And when I relay, when I tell you, hey, you know, Dark Star said this or Sarah Price said that, do you like imagine like a room of people listening to you? Like, no. How, does, how do you visualize this? I don't. I don't have the mental bandwidth to visualize things while painting, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't really see anything. I just, I, I kind of, it's funny. I kind of just imagine like their comment popping up in like the live chat, like on the screen. Oh. Cause uh -huh. like I, like I've watched a bunch of the live streams, like, like when Kevin did them, like I would usually like be behind the wall and have it open on my computer mm. um, or phone or whatever. So I'm like probably more familiar with that setup of communication than like I am on this side. Um, huh. So I kind of just, see it that way it's kind of funny now that i think about it nothing's changed and yet everything has changed i do not see a room full of people that's such a terrifying idea <laughs> <laughs> no I think I've seen some of like these people's profiles on Instagram. So if you say their name, sometimes I'll like just think of their profile picture in my head, which is kind of funny too. Mm. Like for Dark Star, I see that painting of like the, like the girl with the pearl earring, but like stylized, which is kind of funny. Oh, uh huh, yeah. <laughs> How would you feel if all of this was contrived? What do you mean? Well, <laughs> I guess it could happen in multiple ways. But what if everyone who's in the chat right now yeah. was actually somehow hired to oh. be in the chat so that you didn't feel like you were alone? <laughs> oh, and then everyone in the chat needs to get a, get a real job. Oh. <laughs> That'd be so funny, though. <laughs> oh, Alex said then that would actually be 1984. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Now, what if none of these people in the chat existed, but they were all created by me um, are you, are you in the God? moment? <laughs> what? what? Are you God? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm not. <laughs> it's like the Matrix, but it's just like a really low budget version of the Matrix. <laughs> uh... So like all the, you like made up all the trolls too. That's be funny. Oh man. You know, I'm, I'm not uh, creative enough yeah. <laughs> to handle everything that the trolls It's like you, you can't make this stuff up. 
you really know, can't. It's, no. like, it's just like it is what it is. Yeah. Sarah just, Price said, Daniel, you're going to make her paranoid. LOL. She won't know how supportive we are. Hmm. Are you really there? <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry. Oh, good question from Dee Dee. Yeah. She said, I might have missed this. Does the painting have a name yet, or do you want to wait n until you are done? I'm going to wait. I have like a joke name in my head, um, but I'm not actually going to call it that. So. <laughs> Will you, are you willing to share the joke name? Yeah. So there's a painting I did like in February that a lot of people seem to like. Um, I call it Andrew because it's of my friend Andrew from college. And it's just like he's like leaning back and there's like this very dramatic light coming at him. And then he has like this one like great like blue wing like extended like all the way behind him. And it's like. Very yeah. cool. It's very cool. I can pretty. pull that up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So in my head, this is like baby Andrew. So it's just like a smaller kind of like compliment to that painting. So I don't think anyone would want to buy this painting if it was a new baby Andrew, though. <laughs> so I'll come up with something <laughs> better, I promise. Uh, here it is. <laughs> baby Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> It's funny, <laughs> but it has no ac practical application. No, I'm kidding. I, I won't do that. I'll probably name it later. Daniel knows how good I am at naming things, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh oh. Nicholas is waiting for his check. His what? He's waiting for his check because we've hired him for oh. the live stream. <laughs> so full disclosure, this is not a, uh, a Big Brother 1984 Full disclosure, situation. this is not real. Plot twist, <laughs> I'm the bot. You guys, like, <laughs> you guys oh. are just roped into watching this, mm. this like, science experiment perform. Now who's paranoid? I'm kidding. <laughs> Computer user said. Computer user. Which is a perfect username to, to chime in at this time. Said everyone in here is actually Kevin with multiple accounts. He has problems. <laughs> Kevin has. <laughs> just their comment just Kevin has problems. <laughs> That's so funny. Uh, uh, Kevin, we love you, in case you're watching. <laughs> he's not watching. He's busy um, mocking up big paintings that he should have done like a month ago. Mm. Mm. I said it, if you're watching. <laughs> he could be doing both at the same time. He could be. He texts like both of us at once. Shut <laughs> it down. <laughs> Enough. No, Kevin doesn't have time to make so many accounts. He barely has time to like feed himself. So that is like the least of my concerns. Alex said that the wing in this painting is on the other side, though. So maybe it's Andrew spelled backwards. <laughs> just Wor just backwards, Andrew. <laughs> Andrew in reverse. One over Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Ooh. This is awful. <laughs> Stop saying things like that to me. Nic Nicholas is <laughs> complicating the, the plot here. We are actually watching Kevin painting in May. It's just a filter. <laughs> I'm so offended. I am so much more original than Kevin Murphy. I'm kidding. Oh. <laughs> All right. What else would you like to say? <laughs> I'm kidding. It's just Kevin in like a May skin suit. <laughs> just like unscrew something. Just <laughs> <laughs> That's so terrifying and uncomfortable. We just got a chat from Kevin Murphy. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> you don't even know what he said <laughs> yet. <laughs> it's said, just like error 404. <laughs> <laughs> said Big Brother is always watching. <laughs> is, that the, is that the one contribution you're gonna make to this production? It just might be. 
<laughs> go back to your procrastinated labor. I'm kidding. <laughs> wow, you guys are getting along really well today. <laughs> <laughs> this is a side of Kevin that uh, maybe the people in the live stream don't get to see. Is we actually get to have a lot of fun banter with Kevin quite a bit. Usually it's off camera. <laughs> yeah. But here we are <laughs> making jokes at his expense. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> it's a fun time. Kevin said, your training is my contribution. Aw. <laughs> Thanks for making it real, and now I'm ashamed. <laughs> <laughs> Violent shame commences. <laughs> <laughs> So what's your next mental health painting going to be? <laughs> Comment down below, what should my next mental health painting be? Oh, that's actually really good. A room full of people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, cool. Donna Pierce said, I love this piece, and this is the kind of work I want to create. Aww. I've been making figurative narrative works, but need greater skill. You're giving me so much hope. Cool. That is awesome. Larger scale, I want to see it. Yeah, Donna, all jokes aside, that is seriously like why we are here. We're here to inspire and encourage all of you. This is what you can do with these skills. And yeah, so awesome to hear that. You're on your way. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh, okay. Did they see that or did I just jump? I think they did, yes, it's oh, okay. okay. Wow. That was karma. I I talked too much smack. <laughs> Not only is Kevin a paint whisperer. Any suggestions for the next mental health painting? I'm not getting these, so I'll put it in the chat. <laughs> Sounds like a Car Caravaggio like master copy or something. <laughs> <laughs> What? <laughs> what? <laughs> oh no. Got some good suggestions here. Yeah. Nicholas said paint the scream. <laughs> I'm sure that'll help you calm down. I would love that. And then Alex said, I strongly vote for Kevin the Minion in Mona Lisa style. I knew style. someone was going to say something related <laughs> to Minions. I don't know why I got that feeling. It's a deeply uncomfortable feeling. <laughs> I don't think I'll be able to finish that. I'd just be like laughing the whole time. <laughs> It'd just be like a waste of waste of material. I'd do that digitally. Maybe it would serve its purpose though. I, I feel like Kevin would have let me do that in his space. If I did that at home. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> you know, like back then they wouldn't allow any like religious imagery because you know that's like idolatry, it's like illegal. It's like the same thing, you know. I can't paint Kevin as the minion <laughs> in his space. <laughs> um it's also heresy.
my god. <laughs> just, don't look that image up. It was terrifying. Please don't. You're all looking it up now, aren't you? <laughs> the image of Kevin the Minya in as the, a, minion, yeah, as the Mona Lisa, Lisa style. Yeah. Yeah, quite frightening. <laughs> Did you just look it up? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What a time to be alive. It is 9.15. Okay. Does that make you feel better or worse? Uh. Just right? Just right. Okay. Good enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're filling it in pretty quickly, which is nice. Mm -hmm. Can't see the top very well because of glare. That's okay. <clears throat> we could find you a box. <laughs> <laughs> I just like jump up from our. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah Price said, I wonder if Mona Lisa painted a self portrait. Would it have a different personality? I mean, everyone perceives themselves differently than other people perceive for them. Mm -hmm. What is that? What is this? What? Where are these shapes coming from? Nicholas said, I like the variation that is happening in the feathers. Thanks. This is the courtesy of being lost. <laughs> and Alex said, all jokes aside, maybe something in a different, looser style, like Monet's bridge. He uses too much paint. I'm too miserly for that. <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, in general, like a looser style would be nice to use sometimes. Like what I did last time was good, but like Monet is just full on like paint, 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 stacks. At least that's what it feels like to me. So somewhere in between. What are you thinking about right now? I am figuring out why I left these areas blank because it should mean something. I think there's shadows in a different color. Might have been like the blue versions. Also just sneaking in more blue. <laughs> Whoa, that's so blue. That's too much. Okay, okay. Um, it looks cool though, doesn't it? I don't know if you can see it on the screen as well. Um, let me pull it up on the... Oh, wait, that hit a blue right there? Yeah, like here. Mm-hmm. It's probably a little too much. Nope, not on camera, at least. Really? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I glazed the entire thing in, like, bright turquoise the next time. <laughs> Just like a certain someone on a certain other painting that was also live-streamed. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. I'm a true fan, see? <laughs> Didi asked uh, for you, May. Yeah. How did your fellow high school students and teachers accept your work? Many times, educators can become envious of their students. It has been going on for thousands of years. There's an unwritten rule that the student cannot exceed the teacher in ability. Um, I didn't really do art classes at all in high school because I didn't have time in my schedule because I was doing orchestra as well. So I didn't have time for both like music and art. Um, so I didn't really have that problem in school. Um, my peers were mostly focused on like their own extracurriculars and grades and stuff. So it, didn't, it wasn't really relevant to them and they weren't interested in art as a skill really at that point because 
Um, the district we came from was, I came from was pretty like academically competitive. So at the time, most people were in like freshman, sophomore year. They're already like pretty committed to a certain path of like clubs and club positions and extracurriculars and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, it wasn't really a big deal. So much blue, that's so enjoyable. Um, yeah, I don't think it really was a big deal, at least like in my high school. I mean, there were a few people who like also did art, but I didn't really view them as like competitors. They're just like, oh, you're a fellow artist, okay. And we're like studying with different people with different like mediums, different techniques and pedagogies and stuff. So it's just like different. Um, but like none of them were like going into art as like a vocation the way I am. So I guess that also like took the edge off. Mm -hmm. And regarding Kevin, Sarah Price said, and this is very true, Kevin has actually talked about wanting his students to outdo him. Yeah, he talks about that quite a bit. He looks, looks forward to it. You figure that he didn't, he was just beginning to understand the fundamentals. Oh, well, actually, I can't even speak for him when, but it was quite some time. He was already doing great work. Um, but he didn't, hadn't fully pieced it together. Um, he started making good paintings at, I believe, 21 or 22 or something. Mm -hmm. So he has students who are like 11 years old, 13 years old, are making incredible paintings. So just statistically, they have a lot more years on him to develop their skills beyond what he can do. And... I'm that saying that happy. as yeah. <laughs> Kevin has told that to me. I'm not just, uh, I'm saying that on behalf of Kevin for everyone here. What? Nicholas Probe said, yeah, I'm jealous of all these younglings becoming Jedi masters at a young age. <laughs> it is what it feels like. <clears throat> mm -hmm. But it's exciting, too. It's very cool. Yeah. Andrew Lau. Andrew. Oh, the camera's that way. Hi. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> um, he told me to tell you that Whoa. he likes your dog painting. What? Oh, wait, sorry. Pog painting. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. I read that wrong. I was like, I don't think the dog. Pog painting? Pog. Yeah. What Thanks, is Pog? <laughs> um, it's like, it's like gamer speak. I guess. Oh, okay. And um, I picked it up from him and his friend group over the course of the past school year. It stands for uh, play of the game, I think. So it just basically it just means like great, cool, swag, epic. Got good, it. Good stuff. But, um, thanks, Andrew. Didn't so, think you'd hop on. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for jumping in. So <laughs> which Pog painting is this? <laughs> <laughs> Am I saying it wrong? No, it's funny just hearing it from you. Cause, like, <laughs> usually, you, like you're like articulate, you know. Um, <laughs> Pog is like, it's like intentionally like not articulate. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny. <laughs> I'm I guess trying to mean, learn. <laughs> <laughs> I guess he means this one. Do you? So even though this one isn't necessarily video game related, it it could still apply as Pog. You could still use the word, yeah, to uh -huh. just mean like good, great, okay, good swag. But um, it's very polarizing. Like you can only use it ironically, otherwise people will like shame you. You can only use it ironically. Yeah. So is he being sarcastic about? No, this like, it's it's hard to explain. I guess it's like double irony now because it's like you don't actually want to use 
pog as <laughs> why am I saying this on camera? <laughs> as like educate us, please. <laughs> it, it's it's not like a word that you want to like you you can you can mean it in like like to equate with like good swag whatever, but you don't want to be known for like using it commonly because that that denotes that you're like a you know you like game all the time you like don't go outside and you need to like touch grass and that sort of thing. So <laughs> it. Like it characterizes you in like a bad way, but like the word is, like means good stuff, and so. I see. I, I don't. Think I, understand. I, I don't know how to. Yeah, no, I think that's making sense. Carry on. I don't want to. The carry word itself on. is a compliment, but it's also a reflection on the kind of person that you are, yeah. which has a negative connotation. connotation. Yes. Got it. Yes. Whew. It's funny, like I. That's just like a very like kind of subconscious like understanding I have um, at this point. And like I started saying it even though like I've never played like video games like ever. Um, just from like company in college. <clears throat> and now my friends make fun of me for it. Which is, which, you know, I deserve. So it's okay. Andrew approves. <laughs> Why said, would you make me go through that, Andrew? <laughs> <laughs> he said excellent explanation, May. Thank you. I appreciate the alliteration in that comment. Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> now that I can get behind. Ugh. I understand that word. Mm. Is that also a reflection on? <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. We're back to like literary meaning, meaning what we say. Yes. <laughs> Okay, here's a question. Yes. <laughs> Are you glad to change subjects? <laughs> yeah. Someone's gonna like crop that out of the video and like make a bit out of it or something. <laughs> okay. Yes. Here we come. Yes. From Nicholas. Yes. May. Yes. Say one day. One day. Painting became outlawed by the government. Well, 1984 for real, for real. Okay, continue. <laughs> Would you still be painting in your basement and smuggling your paintings to underground galleries throughout America? Um, yeah, probably. Uh, there's nothing better to do, you know, if society is already like that messed up, like what are you going to do? Like dig, dig trenches for the government, like fill holes with cement, you know, like I'd rather paint and get caught than like I don't know, do 1984 activities. <laughs> that makes sense. So we are, I think we may have lost your, your audio mic, so I'm going to supply you some new batteries. Um, I apologize everyone if you were hearing some static noise. We will solve this immediately. Be right back.
Thank you for bearing with us, everybody. Hilariously, I was actually commenting to Kevin before he left. Oh, he left? Um, well, earlier, no, 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 earlier, oh. um, he was at the school, and I was getting set up, and I was talking to Kevin and saying, hey, the, the, the batteries on our mic has been doing very well lately, and I'm very confident that we're going to be able to get through this session without needing new batteries. <laughs> and uh, lo and behold, I was wrong, and so I apologize. So let's give your audio a test again, May. Why don't hello, you speak? Hello, hello. Again? Hello, greetings. How is everyone? Awesome. Yeah, you, everyone here can let me know to confirm. That would be wonderful. Sounds great from Nicholas. Yay. We are back and running. Thank you, everyone. Out of all the things that could have happened on this live stream, explaining the word pog to everyone was like not what I thought would happen tonight, but okay. I am probably going to end up going over time, I feel like, just saying. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Kevin just texted me. He said, deceived you were. <laughs> what? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what a... Yes, Kevin, I'm sorry. What a silly, goofy man. Sometimes we just revert to like Jedi speak because <laughs> yeah, no. I think we make like the Jedi, Jedi, Jedi master like, <laughs> you know, like the student joke like too much. <laughs> <laughs> Bill has just joined us in the live stream. Hi, Hello. Bill. And CL said, I always have the feeling the stream isn't really able to capture the real beauty of the painting. That is so true. <laughs> you guys should come by and see it in person. That would be cool. Yeah. <laughs> You're getting encouragements from Nicholas and Bill to be the feather. Oh my god. Float away. <laughs> Disassociate. Do you feel encouraged? I feel like I'm disassociating. <laughs> I'm flying. Which feather though? That's the problem. <laughs> that's what that's the problem I'm having right now. Which one? What am I doing? I think you get to decide. True. You are the artist after all. I the feather. Probably pick one of the ones that's like overlapping because the colors look really cool there. Oh, where am I? I've like stopped bothering to hide my confusion at this point. I'm just. <laughs>
It is 9.30. Okay. <clears throat> So Teresa Beam is asking, my husband wants to know why the angel has but one feather. You mean wing? Uh, sorry, wing, yes. Okay. I just think it's more interesting that way as an image and as a narrative. Um, it's not symmetrical, which is cool. So that's more interesting. And compositionally, um, yeah, compositionally and aesthetically, having one wing rather than two makes it more interesting to me. And then as a narrative, it's more of like a, it begs the question of like transformation. Um, it's another, not fully human, not fully angel. So it allows for more interpretation, which I, I think more people tend to enjoy, myself included. So. Yeah, creates questions. Open-ended thought from Nicholas Propes. Mm -hmm. I sometimes wonder, is there advancement in art like there is in technology? Like, are there innovations that people keep track of? I think so. Um, well, there's like two sides of it, right? Um, I guess there's like the psych, not psychology, maybe like psychology slash philosophy of art. like what is the purpose of creating during like a certain time era or something. Like for example, like um, I guess like from the Renaissance onwards, like before, like before World War One, pretty much. Yeah, like everyone was like, most artists were very much focused on like perfecting realism and like representing something as accurately as possible um, to like their reference in real life. And then after World War I, um, you know, everyone was very disillusioned with tradition in general and um, started creating kind of, in spite of uh, like the original philosophy of representing reality. And so people are more focused on representing what was inside of themselves. So like their own emotions and beliefs, um, even like political views and stuff like that. Um, so I guess art evolves in that way. 
it, it develops in that way, um, like kind of purpose it has, or what pe kind of purpose people act like it has in, in like s different time periods. Excuse me. And then I guess there's also, um, you know, like the technological side of it and like the economical side of it. So like obviously these days we have digital art, we have like NFTs and all that stuff going on and like modern art kind of shaking up the market in a lot of weird ways. Like, you know, that banana like tape on the wall with duct tape or whatever that was worth like millions of dollars and that sort of thing. But I guess that can also reflect like the psychology of society at the same time. So they kind of play into each other sometimes, I guess. But um, I guess it's less like engineering wise than it is like historically, if that makes sense. Like history encompassing philosophy, kind of technology, um, psychology, that sort of stuff. Yeah, that's a solid answer. <laughs> Question from Bill. Yeah. Do you ever use a mall stick? Um, I've tried. I've been told to. I don't think I use it properly. It scares me because it's like you're, you're supposed to produce like perfect marks with it, and, and then I don't, and then I get like upset. And so. Um, <laughs> Interesting uh, perspective. Yeah. <laughs> it's too much pressure. Um, so like I've tried, and I know the purpose of them, but. And I've seen like Kevin do it and it works out well for him, but I, I don't know, it doesn't work for me yet. I'll figure it out one day, I hope. But yeah, like especially with the science fiction stuff I've been doing lately, like there's a lot of really mechanical, rigid, like straight lines um, that need to be like perfectly straight. So, mall stick definitely good for those. I must say, May, you've done a splendid job of staying out of the camera's way, <laughs> like for this entire live stream. So Thanks. thank you for that. Mm -hmm. It's much appreciated. Once I fan brush it, it'll be even more appreciated. <laughs> Actually, the glare is, we got, don't have any glare. Oh, really? Yeah. Do you? Um, only a little bit at the top, but it's not a big deal. Okay. Yeah, there's some very subtle glare on the dark, dark section of the wing up top. Mm -hmm. It's okay, because I already worked on that. So. Yeah. <laughs> so 
really happy with how well this color that I mixed to match the board is like matching the board. Because it didn't work last time, but I think I got it. I mean, it's not perfect, but it like functions very well. It's so blue. Just adding to the conversation here about advancements in art. Mm -hmm. um, Dee Dee had said advancement in art like materials or design, and I said could be both. Nicholas said that's one aspect. Maybe I'm looking more at the process of creating art. I shared like transferring images, using digital mm -hmm. 3D models to create references. Um, Nicholas said, I mean, transfer is one way, proportional drawing is one way. Some folks start with high chroma areas, some folks start with darks, it's all interesting. Yeah, I mean if you break it down to like a personal level then it gets very like micro, so it's hard to kind of analyze in like an objective sense. And I suppose yeah. it is somewhat hard to keep track of what those different innovative advancements are. Mm -hmm. um, but I would imagine that with the amount of information sharing going on, that people are expanding their kind of their different options and combining different ideas to do new things. And maybe they're tucked away in little nooks and crannies of the internet. <laughs> are they being compiled in one place? Probably not compiled yet. I mean, like art itself is being like curated, but definitely like techniques and stuff aren't being compiled. I feel like in a way that's good though, because then you're kind of forced to like problem solve for yourself instead of just referencing everybody else, um, like right off the bat. I think that process is like more meaningful. Nicholas said, maybe the resistance in art is stronger than in technology. 
I mean, I've seen some doozies of craziness in technology proposals. Mm. Yeah, I think there's been some doozies in art as well, but probably not to the level. I mean, technology, like what is technology, right? It's removing some kind of middleman or finding a new way to do something. So that just by definition, this aspect of art is in the realm of technology. So it stands to reason. Um, here's a question from Sandra. Mm -hmm. May, how do you deal with paintings that go through ugly stages? I believe in the idea that they will not be ugly when I'm done. Um, <laughs> and um, I mean, I'm, I've been using the same process for a while, so I like know how it goes. And so I kind of have experience with both perceiving the ugly phase and getting out of it. Um, so confidence and experience that builds confidence, basically. Yeah, if you have a process that you know works, mm -hmm. it's easy to uh, trust the process to keep moving it forward. If you're in an ugly stage, um, it can be tempting to stop preemptively. But processes are really helpful because they guide you to the direction, to the right direction. Mm -hmm. I mean, even earlier, right, May had mixed out her palette and it all looked really good. And then she's painting um, based on what the palette has been dictating. And then she, it was her, um, that light gray color. Mm -hmm. And when you put that down, you saw how that played and you made a very slight adjustment. It wasn't nothing too major. Mm -hmm. So you're just that, that kind of just that flow of decision making is so much easier. And even if there is something that is slightly off, you can make a course correction um, to keep yourself on track. From Teresa. So I always have to step away from my paintings every few minutes and look at it from a few feet away. Does May do that much? It doesn't seem like she does. I mean, usually I do. Um, since I want to stay in the frame, I'm not doing that as much. <laughs> um, but yeah, usually I do that very often. Usually I paint standing as well, um, which helps. So yeah, that's why I requested to do this one standing. It definitely allows me a lot more flexibility than sitting. I like what Kevin had to do before. So mm -hmm. I'm glad we were able to set this up. But yeah, like normally if I'm not live streaming, then yes, I'm standing up pretty often. Do not be deceived. Do you have a favorite artist? Um, I think someone asked this a while ago. I like dropped a bunch of like usernames from Instagram and stuff. Um, yeah, I think that may have been the first live stream. Mm -hmm. I guess. I guess I, I won't make you like type out all the Instagram people. So I guess I'll just go with like the the older ones. Um, I really like Sargent mm -hmm. and Rubens. Um, Rubens, all this stuff is like very dynamic, very realistic, super, super engaging. They're like the, they're like the murals slash like action movie posters back of the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think it's very cool. Um, Sergeant, um, his use of color is crazy. And like his brush strokes just get like so confident, like once he like loosens up his style. And I just, I just love that. I love perceiving that so much. <laughs> um, there's the main two. There's a bunch of like, artists who I follow on Instagram who I really like, but I don't want to harass Daniel and make him type out a bunch of usernames. <laughs> Much appreciated. <laughs> so 
But yeah, if you do want to go and see what those are, I believe it was the first live stream that we did with May. Mm -hmm. We asked her those questions. Question from Mary Jo. Mm -hmm. Do you ever use clove oil if you are doing a painting that will take a long time? Um, usually, um, no, um, because I pretty much, I've been direct painting like most of my stuff, essentially. Um, so I don't really use the same colors again or the same palette again. Um, so like that doesn't really apply but there have been a few times where I'm like working on something that just like has like a really big like area. Um, and I'm still like direct painting, it's just like really big and I like can't finish it in time and the paint's like drying and I'm like tired and you know, everything's on fire and it's horrible. But um, and uh, then I'll, I've like added clove oil a few times so I can just work on the same thing for a few consecutive days. Um, but usually it doesn't last for like a whole painting. I do love how it smells, though. Oh my yeah, God. I was asking you just about to say that. It's so nice. It I think really Kevin's is. allergic, though. He gets, like, runny nose and everything. I feel bad. Mm. That's also why I try not to use it. We're almost there, guys. Almost there. Kind of. <laughs> kind of? Kind of. We are coming up at 10 o'clock. Mm. It's uncomfortable. That's uncomfortable? Yeah. I mean, like, I knew it was coming, but still. Because, <laughs> like, last time we went over time, and I, don't, I didn't want to do that again. What would you project to finish this? I like another... At least like 20 minutes. <laughs> it's not something I'm quite pleased about. But, um, the painting must go on. <laughs> Uh, yes, Sarah. So we do not include clove oil in our Evolve kits. We did used to at one point, but we did stop. Here's a good question from Nicholas. Mm -hmm. When Kevin says something about, or when he says something about your painting, do you get defensive or do you submit to his glory? <laughs> <laughs> this is a fun question. But I, I think it's a good question, actually. It is a very good question. Uh, Daniel's seen this in action, actually. Um, yep. Um, I think I started off 
like during the apprenticeship, I started off like very, um, what's the word? Deferent, yeah, deferent to uh, what Kevin would tell me because you know I had accepted that I knew nothing and I needed and I was like on a journey to like relearn the right things. Um, I think these days, like, usually it's not about like what's like wrong with the painting, like color wise or like shape light shadow. It's like none of it's not really like the fundamentals or anything. It usually comes down to like the composition of something, um, how detailed. Like I rendered something, um, and and it's just really about how to like optimize like the image, um, like as a composition, um, like for like how easy it is to read, um, and just like how much information I like really need to like put into something or a certain area in order to like not waste my time on putting in too much information and like that sort of thing. Um, and so sometimes like if I spent a long time like rendering something, he's like, you did not need to do that. And I was like, but it looks really good. But he was like, yeah, but like you did not need to do that. And I'll get like, you know, a little bit like, like sad because I'm like, I didn't need to do that, but like I did and it looks really good. So it was like, I could, I did, but like it wasn't like necessary. And so sometimes I'm like a little irritated at myself for that. But then at the same time, like part of me like wants to like render everything else like best as I can to kind of like prove to myself that I can. Like even at the expense of like my own time. Um, and so that's just like a me thing. And then like sometimes with like compositional stuff, like I like, I like it when like a lot of things are happening <laughs> in like a painting or like an image. I think it's, it's like more engaging that way. It's just more interesting. And then also like from the painter standpoint, it's like, you know, I get to like show off how many different things I can paint. Um, at the same time in an image, which is like cool. Um, but sometimes like, um, and usually Kevin like tells me it's like too much and it kind of like distracts the viewer and it's like hard to read and that sort of thing. Um, especially cause I'm like trying to do book covers and stuff and like the image gets like compressed and people will get like a first impression of it. It's not like something people will like stare at for like a very long time. Um, but I feel like as an artist, like I, I want people to look at my stuff for a long time. Um, and like just to have like more elements involved is like more like enjoyable for me, but it's like not good for like what I'm actually trying to do. So sometimes when we're like coming up with compositions or like at the end of a painting, um, we're making final like decisions about what it should look like. Um, we can kind of butt heads a little bit and I do get defensive <laughs> uh, sometimes. Uh, like with that illustration that, I, that I've shown you guys a few times. Um, uh, like originally like the sky had like a lot more going on in it. Like Kevin had like a flare gun and it really like dominated like the upper third of the piece. And it like looked really cool. Um, like the space was like all illuminated behind it and like um, just like that whole area was like much more dynamic. Um, as like an extreme like light source and then like how that was affecting everything around it And so I, I really loved how it looked but you know like the top third of a book cover is like where the title goes and um, And like the author name and like all like that sort of thing um, And so it's supposed to be like nice and quiet to allow for that other stuff to take center stage And then also like there was so much stuff going on up there that um, it was allegedly <laughs> um, It was like distracting like, that distracting from like the figures like in the middle and like the actual like kind of narrative of the piece. Um, so yeah, usually usually I don't get defensive, but if it's something I just really really like, <laughs> um, then sometimes I will. But like I I usually still listen to what he has to say because he knows better and I know that and we both know that. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin has jumped in. Oh boy. He what? said to, to me, ask her about that time period when she gave me the stink eye every time I gave her a critique. She's great now, but there was definitely a struggle at one point. What is this about? I don't, I don't, I don't know what this. he's talking about. I think he's, I, I think he's just starting drama. Oh, is that I what didn't, it is? I didn't do the stink eye thing like when he wanted, when he gave me critique. I did that like when he wanted to like paint on my painting to like show me something or change something or like if he's telling me to change something I don't, I don't remember like specific instances but I do remember like him like 
painting on my painting to like demonstrate something and I'd be like annoyed because then like I felt like I couldn't say that it was like my painting. Um, so there was that, but I don't think I ever did that with like critique unless I just have like really selective memory and it's coming out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe Kevin can jog our memory here. <laughs> maybe Kevin cannot do that. <laughs> that would be great too. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm embarrassed about something I don't even like remember. <laughs> well, I gave him a hard time too, so. <laughs> Cheers to giving Kevin a hard time. <laughs> yeah. I'm kidding. Please do not give this man a hard time. <laughs> Sarah Price said, LOL, Kevin, Yoda turn returns to call out his Jedi. It's a hard life out here, you know? You take criticism all the time and then you get criticized for it? What is this? I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin's like writing like a whole like essay right now. <laughs> Instance one, October 21st, 2020. Second offense. <laughs> For me, I I usually uh, make a counter argument. <laughs> I usually fight him. <laughs> what? I fight him. <laughs> yeah. No. Well, kind of. I mean, it's just my, <laughs> I have this, uh, I've always been doing this. There's a lot more, uh, since now Kevin and I are, if you haven't heard our story, um, I won't trouble you all with it now, but somewhere out there I have a story of, I've shared a story of how Kevin and I didn't get along all the time, but because uh, <laughs> I, I would always challenge what he said, and I actually still do that. It's just that we're... <laughs> We're friends now, so it's okay. <laughs> See, sometimes me and um, Daniel challenge him together, and that gets messy. Yeah, yeah that's fun. <laughs> um, but I think it's sort of just like, because we're friends now, and he knows that it's, for me, it's the most effective way of r arriving at a solution point. Because even earlier this week, I was working on this, this painting I'm working on, and I was kind of just sharing some, some struggles with Kevin, and he responded, and then... I responded back about, you know, how that's not working or whatever. And in the end, he was still right. But by <laughs> me, like, you know, having that sort of mock fight with him, it helped me really sort of narrow down on what the solution needed to be. And if honestly, if I just said, yes, you're right, Kevin, then I probably wouldn't have found the solution that I needed. Um, so... <laughs> I don't know how enjoyable that is for Kevin, but it's uh, it's a process that, that works for me at this point. So it's sort of like a mutual understanding. I'm gonna I'm gonna make a counter argument, and hopefully you'll you'll defeat me so that I can then find my solution that I need. <laughs> I'd like to make a public apology if I ever gave Kevin stink eye without remembering it at this point. <laughs> <laughs> there are some instances I do remember. Uh, I was like, why are you, why are you doing this to me? But, um. <laughs> oh, we got a very heartfelt message from the master, Kevin oh Murphy. God. He said, you two are a couple of my favorite people in the world. Aww. I never mind the back and forth. I thought he just said, never mind after saying that. <laughs> <I know>. <laughs> <laughs> Those are some of my favorite people. Never mind. <laughs> That's so funny. Thank One of my you, favorite Kevin. people, too. But you knew that. Maybe it's one of the reasons why we're one of Kevin's favorite people in the world. Maybe he appreciates the adversity. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin likes the hard times because he does like a good fight. Hard times create strong men. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you for that, May. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I just. <laughs> <laughs> just, it's just a bit I have with a friend, <laughs> and, uh, and that's it. <laughs> uh. <laughs> all right, all right. We're gonna we're gonna go into overtime peacefully. I gotta say, laughter is so contagious. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. I'm fine. It is nice to see that hit of light on the top of that wing. Mm -hmm. It certainly does a lot. I am making it up as I go. <laughs> Full disclaimer. There is none of the transfer visible here, so I am just I'm just saying things with my paintbrush. <laughs> the urge to make it like neon blue. <laughs> Okay. Now we make it colorful. It's probably not dark enough. Uh, May, can you point to the color you just used to capture the light on the top of that wing? I just used the, I think there's this one. Okay. It's supposed to match the board. Um, yeah. I don't want it to make it like super bright up there. Um, mm -hmm. And now you're using this colorful transition. Mm -hmm. That I just mix with my brush from like all the warm colors on my palette. <laughs> and then is that going to also blend into the background? Um, not the background, just like the feathers underneath. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. It's, it's like really light. I'm not enjoying that. Maybe I just use this dark purple straight out of the tube. It's working. This will be refined later. <laughs> Kevin said, that wing is coming along beautifully. I can't wait to see it in person tomorrow when I get to the school. Aw. Thank you. <laughs> I am about to... Uh, 
I, I don't know. I, I want to like add in that like last value, but I also want to like maybe wait to like make that decision. Cause like this might be bright enough. Like I, I probably don't need more contrast. It like reads fine. Like any anything more would be just like embellishment at this point. But there are a few things I need to add. So in like the stem thing in the feather, it's like dark around the edges and then like the inside it's like translucent so it like looks lighter. So I think we're gonna go down to a smaller brush and then just like put that line in. It's like split, I don't trust it. Okay. Um, okay. So I think we're just gonna take this color. It's like this very light peach. Gonna drop it in there. Oh, I'm probably gonna have to cover it because I'm like, I have to get close to it so I don't. Okay, that's fine. Ah, oh, you can't even see it. Oh. Okay. Ah, uh, there we go. Can they see that or no? Mm, probably not. It's okay. This might be better after it dries. Um, it's like sitting on top of wet paint. This one needs to be like really thick. But the marks are supposed to be delicate, so it's probably like not good. Yeah, I, I should probably stop. <laughs> probably for next time. I do want to add some more color into those shadows. They, I mean, they're gray, but they don't have to be that gray, I feel like. <laughs> um, I also need to soften the edges between the feathers and the um, mm -hmm. background. So let me, I'm going to resolve this stuff. This is like, the shapes are too small. They don't look like feathers, they look like dandruff. So I'm gonna like <laughs> brush them out a little bit before I forget. Um, okay, that's like kind of better. Um, Let's see where I can put this color to kind of unify it with all the stuff that's overlapping, but not too much because I do want this to stand out. It's like very colorful. Yes, Karen, we will have a picture of this before the next live stream so that everyone can see it. Oh, that's so nice. I don't know if they can even see that, but it's enjoyable. It's fun when it really starts. You start to see it coming together in the moment. I have to be very careful about not putting this in too many places. Otherwise, it's like, it's too much, and then it doesn't stand out because it's everywhere. Um, And it looks contrived. I never want that. Well, this orange and parts that are like really close to the blue looks like. Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Relationships. Relationships. <laughs> Make the world go round. Make the paintings go go well. Yes. <laughs> I'm so glad I added that blue in and I was indulgent and silly. Um
There's like a lot more going on in here in the reference, but I think that's something for the next pass. Like these really refined, like light feathery marks. Um, I'm not gonna worry about them right now. They'll go on better when this is all dry and I can make really like fine marks. It is 1020. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that was fast. It was like 950, like not that long ago. It's coming along really nice, May. Thank you. Now I'm just gonna resolve this edge and then and I'll leave you guys alone. <laughs> Let me clean this. And I think. Mm. I'm gonna try this color, and if that doesn't work, I'll try that one. And if that doesn't work, I will make something. <laughs> okay. I have to block the camera a little. Oh, that's that's good. working. It's going to like connect it with the shapes of the feathers a little bit as well so it doesn't just read like an outline. Um, that would be kind of productive. Hey, Rip Mero. So the, there isn't a weekly, well, actually, okay, so there's, there's two schools, actually. There's the Art Academy, which is the brick and mortar school that May and I are in right now. And there is a weekly price associated with that. I'm actually not sure exactly what the price is on the top of my head, um, but you can come in for a week, uh, free trial class um, if you're in the area in New Jersey. Um, but for the Evolve program, we don't do weekly prices. We actually do a, there's two ways to pay. It's a one-time payment or a payment plan of 12 payments um, each month for 12 months. And so the price of the Evolve program is 2,500 all up front or 249 a month for those 12 months. Um, and that includes all the art supplies, everything and the payment plan would would stop at the end of the 12 months it's not like a subscription or anything because we believe that the education should be an investment and you're getting what you pay for and then you can go at your own pace regardless of the uh, the money situation so hopefully that answers your question and if you ha if you want you can check out links in the description of this live stream and uh, take a look at what's available and then I also said earlier uh, for this live stream that we're actually doing a live webinar. So um, Kevin and I are going to be live. We're going to have instructors and everything give you kind of a clearer picture if you are interested in checking out um, and seeing how Evolve works and how we can get artists to pro level skills in about a year's time. It's August 2nd. August 2nd, yes. 8 p.m. EST. And there's a link to register for that. It's the first link in the description, and I think maybe I can pull it up here. Yeah, just drop the link in there for you. The advanced program is the same price 
has the foundation program, but they are two different uh, programs with different tuitions. And the advanced program is optional. The foundation program will take you to pro-level skills um, at that high level of realism. And then the advanced program builds on top of it. Um, one way to think of it is like if you're learning how to paint and how to get these skills, that's the foundation program, getting the foundational skills to create art without limitations. And then the advanced program helps you uh, connect the dots into expanding into different um, techniques and slightly different styles and getting more into an intuitive realm of creating art. So like for example what May is doing here would be indicative of a advanced painting. But she's still applying all of the foundational skills that she's learned from the foundation program into this painting. So it builds on top of each other. <laughs> Nicholas said, it's really, I really got lucky stumbling into this program with no idea what art, art education was. So T.Y. is asking, I'm not sure if this was asked, I was wondering, why one wing? <laughs> so we do get this question quite a bit. And, uh, every live stream. Every live stream, yep. So, which is actually, to me, it's really cool because yes. it, it sort of proves out the intention of the painting for May. Yes. Um, but before you answer, May, um, T.Y. also added, does it have a mythological meaning like those Greek heroes or gods I hear about? If you wanted to, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so basically I like the visual of like the one wing because it has both like, it's nice visually and it's also nice narratively because visually it's asymmetrical and that's always more interesting to me than pure symmetry. Um, and then um, narratively it's more interesting than just an angel or just a human because it implies like change, transformation, something's happening, something happened already. Um, so, yeah. I haven't heard of, I guess like Icarus is the first like winged Greek, Greek mythology figure to come to mind, but that's not really suitable. I mean, maybe it is, he did like fall. So, I don't know, come up with your own narrative, let me know. There was this guy, um, I don't forget his, it's like Phaeon or something. And he was like, I think he was the son of, oh no, I'm forgetting my Greek mythology. This is embarrassing. Anyway, um, but there was this, he was a demigod and he was very like full of himself and he was like raised by nymphs and like really spoiled and stuff. And he like, I think his dad was, or he was somehow related to Helios who was like the original like son Titan, not God. Um, and uh, he had like the idea that because of this like relation that he was like worthy of um, like riding uh, or like manning Helios's like sun chariot, even though he had like no training or anything. It's like insanely dangerous and only like Titans are supposed to do that. And he was like a demi like God, so like less than Titan. Um, also like only half divine in any way. Um, and so, he like asked his mom for like anything for his birthday and then she was like, yeah, I'll give you anything. And he was like, I wanna, I wanna ride Helios's chariot. And she was like, anything but that, please. And he was like, no. And then he did it and he, you know, he, um, while he was up there, um, Apollo came with his chariot, just like doing his rounds, like letting the sun go across the sky, everything. 
no, no malevolent intent, just being a god, which um, this character was not Theon, I guess. And he fell to earth in a very dramatic and sad sort of way. Um, kind of similar to Icarus, actually. But I think he was more about hubris than Icarus, and Icarus is more about kind of just naive, like, carelessness. So I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. If you find any other winged uh, Greek figures, let me know. I love Greek mythology. I'm just like kind of rusty. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna fan brush this, and then and then everyone can go to sleep. <laughs> oh, it's so textured. It's so textured and yummy. Okay. Um. <laughs> So this is a fan brush and it looks like a fan, that's why it's called a fan brush. And the way we use it is, um, we don't use it to like make strokes or marks or anything. We press it very, very lightly against, against the panel or canvas or whatever you're working on. And we kind of make like little circular motions or um, just kind of random motions. And that helps to like smooth out the texture of the paint so that it has like this nice kind of polish. And um, it also photographs more nicely because there's like less variation in like the surface. Mm -hmm. So it catches light more evenly. And so usually I do two passes with the fan brush. Um, one of them is like, you know, the sort of circular motion that I just mentioned. Yeah, um, and it's, it's <clears throat> subtle because there's not much glare on this painting anyways, but mm -hmm. it is also like, you might be able to tell it's taking out some of the glare and allowing us to see the and it's, you, it's not blending the paint together, it's simply just smoothening the surface so this that you can see the painting. This is not a shortcut to making gradients, yeah. Correct, <laughs> yes. Yeah. And then I'm going to use the same brush and um, kind of pull everything down in the same direction. I'm going to clean it a little bit first. Because that can't hurt. So how you clean it is you kind of like pinch the bristles at the end and you kind of rub it against the paper towel. just helps pull all the paint in the same direction. Yeah, that looks pretty good to me. And I know we're very over time, so <laughs> we can wrap this up <laughs> fast. Awesome. Yeah, we did it. We did the wings. <laughs> we made it. Yeah, May yeah. looks beautiful. Thank you. Really nice job. <laughs> You. Really good. Very excited to see this, uh, how it all turns out. But mm -hmm. yeah, looking beautiful. Thank you. Um, <laughs> okay, last question from Nicholas. Yes. Just wondering, because I'm doing it more often these days, mm -hmm. is sealing the painting over and over a good idea? Um, if you're sealing it just for like the sake of sealing it, then like, no. But in general, like between passes, where you're like covering like large areas and you like need to know exactly what's underneath in order to make the right decisions about colors and values, yada yada, um, for the next pass, then like, yeah. But if you seal your, I mean, if you don't like need that, then like I wouldn't seal your painting just cause it's like sitting there and dry. Um, kind of wasteful. <laughs> but yeah, and then I guess also like if you seal it more often, you run the risk more often of like not doing it properly. So you might build up like uneven areas across across the surface of whatever you're working on. But I don't think it makes too big of a difference though. Um. That's it. <laughs> All right, beautiful. All right. Thank you, May. Thank you everyone for sticking around, if you're still here. Um, Ta-da, we did it. <laughs> <laughs> We're almost done, I think, so. Awesome, Yeah. thank you very much. Okay. Take care, night. everybody. Mm -hmm. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>